go alive, go alive, go alive. Hello, everyone. Where's my hand cleaner? <sighs> Oof. I need some more iron brew. Oh, good lord, I drank a lot of iron brew today. I'm alive. Dum bum ba yum. Bum 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 bum. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So, as always, what's the first thing I have to say when I'm ever I'm doing a live? We are live. This is a live video. I will be interacting with the chat. I realize there are some who watch this channel who find it very distressing when I do these videos. As I say to all of you, if you really prefer a long patrol, go, please go watch the recorded long patrols. The one for this one will come out probably on the 20th, I think. It'll be on the 20th of April and it'll be at seven o'clock. It'll go and come out and you can watch it all through then. If you really don't like a live, please do watch it then. Now, today's topic is if Lord Fisher died in January, the January 1914, how does Prince Louis of Bamberg perform his first SL? And that's actually a more complicated one than I'd, I'd like to say, because there is quite a few factors which bring him down. And those factors are more than just Fisher, although Fisher is a big part of it. If Fisher had wholeheartedly supported him, there could have been a very different circumstance. But we'll get into that. This is an interesting one because Louis is his own character, okay? One of the things I find annoying about Louis of Badenburg is the amount of people who try and write him off at various points. He's had quite a storied naval career. He has been promoted despite being a prince. One of the things that's often... How do I put this? Often misunderstood about the British approach to royalty working in the armed forces and those of high noble birth is that it, rather than it helping your career, especially in the Navy, it often hinders your career. You're held to a higher standard. You have to be. Because the view is this. Yes, you're supposed to serve, if you're a member of the royal family or nobility. Yes, you're supposed to be part of the forces. And, you know, you're supposed to do your service for your country. However, if they promote you to a senior position and you muck up, it looks bad on all of them. So, for every hoop everyone else has to jump through, they have to jump through another hoop. Now, the really interesting thing, of course, is there are hoops for everyone. And everyone has their own set of hoops. So, in a way, it sort of starts to balance out. Because if you're from a middle class background, you have to jump through the hoops of can you deal with nobility. And that's a whole different set of political, political hoops. If you come, for, if you've worked your way up from the decks, well, that's a whole set of hoops on its own, isn't it? Getting up from the decks, proving yourself, making sure you have the education, the ability to communicate both written and verbally in the way that's required to be able to be in uh, command, and that means communicating not just those below you but those above you. So, the whole scenario is in many ways rigged against a lot of people. Now, Louis of Battenberg had managed to get through all of that. He managed to get through it all. He had faced regular, ongoing attacks because of his ethnicity. He was a, national, a naturalized citizen. He was a naturalized citizen. But throughout his career, even when he's promoted to commander, even when he's promoted to captain, there is always an MP, quite often from the liberals, who are willing to stand up and go, why are we promoting this foreign-born person over British da 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 this? And, um, yeah, there are a lot of admirals who go to bat for Louis of Bamberg, including Fisher. So, 
when you read books which write him off, think about it for a second and go, hang on, if he managed to impress all these admirals, if in a time period he was actually almost a consensus candidate between the both the moderates of the Beresford faction and the moderates of the Fisher faction that both would support him happily. He must have been fairly good at his job. So, this is who we're talking about today. Hello Mark Harkness, hello John Shea, hello Carmen Gasberg, hello 96831, hello Timo Locker, hello Mark Gooch, hello DG40, hello Stephen Richards, hello Mark, uh, Raptorat, hello Black Maximus, hello everyone. Um, I haven't managed, because I've been dealing with lawyers and all things today, to, arrange, to do the normal thing which I do, which is to share this on Twitter that we're live. So if you don't mind, I'm going to quickly do that, because I do realise some people watch Twitter for the announcement, or X as it's now called, rather than watch, uh, uh, rather than go, uh, YouTube. It happens. There's lots of dis uh, similarities and things going on. It's fun. Now, Twitter. Yeah, that's that code. Oh, good lord. How long has it been since I logged into Twitter? I have 120 notifications on Twitter. I haven't logged in here recently, have I? Because those are, those are notifications from verified people. <laughs> Oh, sugar. That's a lot. What have I missed? <laughs> uh... Now, one of the questions that is probably going to come up is um, why not anyone else? Why not pick uh, someone else? And my argument to that is who's your other option? Your other option, if you have one, is probably Jellico and you need him to run the Grand Fleet. Um, who's the other option after that? Beresford? Does anyone want to see Beresford, who's one of the most divisive figures, and not as capable as the other divisive figure, in charge of the fleet? Let's be honest, Beresford is the is one of the people who is probably the most extreme with his own faction. And he's part of the trouble. So, yeah. It's fun. It is fun. I have so got to set this up with a Steam Deck or something. I've got to get one of those and get it set up so it can set do all this automatically. Oh, good lord. Uh, I'm not getting into it. There is... I'm not gonna. I, I will say their name because they're commenting publicly. Joe Frannick, if you're watching the live, and I hope you are, so someone can. I will, I'm going to go and send a, send a comment to him now. Because he's watching the live. Uh, he is commenting on one of my videos. And I have no qualms about it, but he is trying to defend HMS Furious as a good idea. <laughs> and <laughs> keeps going up with various reasons. She could be a good idea. So, yeah. 
as this is World War One era, and one of the things that's not going to happen in this spoiler is the courageous thing for your class and furious. Um, no, uh, he's just put one of the reasons for he he's gone through destroying mine layers, and I've pointed out the problems of that, and now gone for quick night bombardments of German ports on the west coast of Germany. No, it, it it's that's not a good use of furious, and that's not something furious is actually really designed for because furious. For all, uh, with only two guns, and they had to be specifically shortened, it really wasn't that great, and it really wasn't able to do targeting. HMS Furious was a good idea for a character conversion. HMS Furious was a good idea for... Not, she was not a good idea as she was designed, but as a character conversion, she was fine. Um, she would really have been... They really would have been better off as carriers. They really, really would have been better off as carriers. Ah. Oh. Now, for those who, well, before we start getting into the full details of Louis Van Berg, um, honestly, I should probably talk about his familial, familial relations. Um, he is the eldest son of Prince Alexander of Hesse and the Rhine by the marriage with Julia... Um, von Hawk, um, and that is a Morgan uh, Morganatic marriage, which meant that he inherited the titles of his mother, not his father, because it didn't count. It's always fun. So that's one reason why he goes and joins the Royal Navy. He is also married in the presence of Queen Victoria. To her granddaughter, Princess Victoria of Hessen Rhein. That's the second daughter of Princess Ali, Alice, and Louis Louis the Fourth, Grand Duke of Hesse. They were first cousins, once removed. Okay, they known each other since childhood, and they spoke English of each other. In fact, Louis was often said to be far better in English than he was at other languages, although he certainly did try. And he could do very passable French when he needed to, and even some German when he wanted to. But English was definitely his comfortable language by this point in his life. Um, as wedding present from the Queen, he received the Order of the Bath and the Star and Chain of the Hessian Order of Louis. So, yes. He's an interesting soul. <sighs> He is well connected with the royal family, which should theoretically have made him politically to an extent untouchable. It should have done so. It should have made him to an extent politically untouchable. But the trouble is, he found himself in a perfect storm. Oh, thank you, Jack Ray. Hello and thank you. Who else has joined? Steve Richards. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone who's watching. Hope you're enjoying. So. Before I go too much further, my iron brew glass is not only looking slightly dirty and needs to be cl it needs to be cleaned, um, but needs to be filled up as well. Uh, yes, pretty much. Mahanis, once we get into this, it, it becomes very interesting. Now, as always, thank you to everyone who um, likes, shares, and subscribes the videos to the videos. It's very kind of you, and it's very important because the channel needs to grow. As you all know, I need to hit 15,000 subscribers by Christmas. Uh, that is actually by 11.50, uh, 23.50 hours on roughly on the 24th of December, so that my mother finally wins the bet of my aunt. Uh, that means I need roughly 3,500 subscribers by Christmas. So, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, Alexandra, Empress of Russia, is from Hesse. Um, actually, she's his, one of his sisters, I think. Um, he, he has huge trouble getting, um, his sisters-in-law, his sisters-in-law, um, Alex Empress Alexandra Fedorova and the Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fedorova were killed, of course, in Russia by the Bolsheviks. And he only managed to get the body of the Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fedorova, um, out and he in turn uh, he was the one who saw to her internment in Jerusalem 
and her burial and everything down there. He he is a really one of the interesting things about him is he really is a duty focused gentleman. I'm just going to close this before I have too many things wandering in here. And one of my neighbours complains about getting history instruction. <sighs> They are an uh, interestingly connected family. And as always, shameless book plug because, well, all this book habit which I'm packing up behind me, and probably Sunday is going to be another book boxing video because I still am boxing them. Still, as you can see, they're now piled up on top of the boxes to be boxed here. I've got them down off the top shelves and piled them up so I can box them and then stack them back up. It's, 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 it's a good system. And, um,. Pretty much, yeah, none of that would be possible without your support and without, well, the, the, the work I'm doing at universities was certainly not possible without the people who are buying this. So thank you very much, everyone. So, let's consider Louis Bamberg as a leader. Well, one of the interesting things I find about him is you read some books and you would think he was a complete and utter idiot who didn't have any naval service experience at all. And you sit there and go, well, actually, he's been in the Navy since 1868. Think about that. He'd been in the Royal Navy since 1868. So in 1914, when he is first sea lord, or rather 1912, when he's made first sea lord, 1912, he had been in the Navy for 44 years. He had been commander of the 3rd and 4th Divisions of the Home Fleet. He had been in charge of the Atlantic Fleet. He had been in charge of 2nd Cruiser Squadron. He would served in Naval Intelligence from 1902 05 He commanded HMS Implacable, HMS Majestic, HMS Cambrian. He fought in the Anglo-Egyptian War. His lists of awards are the Egypt are long and storied. This is not someone who is just randomly there. He has got he has worked very, very hard to get where he has become. And of course, the thing is, his family produces another first sea lord. Lord Louis Mountbatten is his son. Remember, this is the man who changes to Mountbatten. And both his sons go on to very, ser very serious, very capable naval careers. His second eldest daughter married Gustav the Sixth of Sweden. And... Of course, his eldest daughter, Princess Alice, married Prince Andrew of Greece and Denmark, and was the mother of Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. And I would argue that a lot of the metal you see in Prince Philip comes from this man. This man is one tough cookie in his own way. He is not like some others who are in leadership positions who will have shouting matches with politicians. One of the jokes that I often see put around him is go, oh, he said quite concur a lot and lo looked quite concur on the notes which Churchill would submit. He'd, you know, he'd agree with them. That's because he would often have his arguments, his disagreements with Churchill, in person, face to face with words. He'd have his discussions and debates with people in person. He didn't write it down. If he disagreed with you, he wasn't going to put it on paper. And that's very much from his background and training. Disagreements should never be noted down, only agreements. That's his sort of family history coming through. That's his style of management. And again, 
well, I find it funny when people say he didn't argue back when I can point to events when he's on the naval and military. He's the joint secretary of naval and military. He's the joint secretary of naval and military affairs committee, which is the pre precursor of the committee for imperial defence, and he is well known for making his case and arguing and winning, and persuading people. He works with the army. And one of the remarks that when he's working in the army is that the, he managed them so beautifully they never realised when they disagreed with him and always ended up doing what he wanted. So, again, the trouble is people compare his style to Fisher and they go, he doesn't fight back like Fisher! Fisher has roaring rows, writes huge sermons, disagrees, sends notes to the papers, all those things. That's not Battenberg's way. But that doesn't mean Fisher's way is right. Let's be honest, Fisher's way is incredibly antagonistic. Fisher's way creates a lot of enemies. Fisher's way creates a lot of problems. Battenberg, he works seamlessly with people like Jellicoe quite happily. Jellicoe is furious when Battenberg goes. Why? Because he has faith in the administrative and capability of Battenberg. But trouble is, Battenberg, by the time he goes, is absolutely surrounded on all sides. Is dealing with fighting even with his own staff and cannot function. He cannot run things. He's begging to be, res to be allowed to let go. Even the king he's begging to allow him to let go. Because the king doesn't want to let him go because he doesn't want Fisher to return. Because he doesn't trust Fisher. And, well, Fisher comes back. There's always got to be first seal on a German name. In Britain, how do you pull it off? By being very good at his job. That's the problem, Darius Radsky. That's the main argument how people go, oh, he, he was promoted. He's got a German name. There are people complaining, even when he's a lieutenant, that he's in the, he's in the service of the Royal Navy, when he's a, just a lieutenant and they're going, oh, should he be being promoted because he's got a German name in Parliament? This man has opposition the entire way up. It's not the connection. Wayne, as I've said at the beginning, the connections don't help him. And in many ways, they hinder him. And Johnny Kate, I'm Dr. Clark. I'm looking at your Elvis Railfast t-shirt and wondering why you don't have an 18-inch gun-themed Adrian Sargent Corps version of it. I would love to. Yeah, I, I, you're going to be seeing a picture later. I've got many designs from an 18-inch Adrian Massage and Core, but they're all done with Ultimate Adult Dreadnoughts, so I'm not sure if I'd be allowed to use them. That's the problem. And Adrian Massage and Core is going to be coming up in this. He is a very, very capable, very able administrator. In fact, the interesting thing is when he becomes First Sea Lord in 1912, Fisher had actually been campaigning for him to become First Sea Lord in 1911. Because in Fisher's words, he was the most able of the admirals around. So think of that. In a Fisher wanted him to be first sea lord from 1911. He wanted him put in post instead of Bridgerman. He's not. But I will tell you this. He's the first sea lord who survives longest with Churchill. And in fact, at one year, 325 days, other than Fisher, he is the longest serving first sea lord until Admiral Beatty. Basically, you have Fisher, who's five years and 96 days. And then BT, who's seven years, 271 days, so BT l lasts longer. 
And then all the ones in, in, in the rest of the time, even the ones which are lauded like Jellico and Weymus, they're all less. They all serve less time than Badenburg. Badenburg comes very close to two years. And the average, of course, for a Sea Lord is mm, uh, a little over, is a, around two and a half to three years. Although there are a fair number who are less and some who are more. I don't think Battenberg would worry what you're eating, Dan. He's not that type. So, how and why did he fall? Well, you have Fisher constantly talking with Churchill. That had been a problem for all the first Sea Lords prior to Battenberg under, under the Churchill as the, as the first Lord of the Admiralty. In that, you have Fisher constantly whispering in their ear, constantly talking to them, constantly putting forward his own arguments and his own views. Um, in answer to that question, Jack Ray, was there such a resistance to recorded relation to French names in England after the Huguenots came after 18, in after 18, 1685? Not really. Average life expectancy in post, Darius Rowski. Um And, you know, Fisher constantly is putting his own arguments together, putting his own... And it's fine when Battenberg is disagreeing with, uh, you know, is agreeing with them. That works out fine. When he's disagreeing with them, he has a lot of trouble. He has to constantly deal with the fact that Fisher never comes in to defend his ideas. He never comes in to argue his ideas out with Battenberg or anyone in the Admiralty. No, he just keeps sending letters to Churchill. And Churchill takes it as the word of God. That is a big trouble you have here. F uh, Churchill takes whatever Fisher says as the word of God. Then you have the other fun. Beresford. This man, the man who, for whom the feud with Fisher between Beresford and Fisher had literally ripped the Royal Navy apart, had torn its political sheet machine, had torn a lot of its a lot of its methodologies and mystique, and ability to influence political events in the UK asunder. Literally, this is what is happening. On top of that, you have newspapers and politicians seeking an easy scapegoat to blame for the war actually happening. I remember Andrew Lambert wrote that no cabinet advised by Fisher would have behave so poorly and manage the situation so poorly as the cabinet did in 1914. And I have to agree with him. But the trouble is, Fisher is advising by letter to Churchill, and Churchill is that because of Fisher's because of Fisher's advice by letter, Churchill isn't listening to Battenberg. And that's a problem. Because Vanberg can deal with the operational side of things, he can do run all that without bothering to deal with uh, without dealing with Churchill. He can sort out all sorts of other issues, the procurement of ships and things. Doesn't really go through Churchill. Churchill tries to get involved, but he keeps being manoeuvred. But what he cannot deal with is what Ch he cannot coach Churchill on what to say if he is not invited and he is not being listened to. Because Churchill isn't even asking him. And that is, you can say that's the failure of Battenberg, but short of censoring Churchill's mail and correspondence and actually getting someone to burn Fisher's letters whenever they arrive, he can't do anything about that. And that's a problem because... In the gentlemen's clubs, he has this one going around slugging him off because he thinks he'll get him in power. And in letters, 
he has this one putting forward an argument which is entirely antithetical to the actual decision-making going at the time. And one of the problems, I would say, with Fisher's advice is Fisher's advice in many ways is designed to create a situation where he gets to come back and become the Amalissimo. Because both of these men want to come back and be the first Sea Lord for this war and get the glory. They both want that. That is their dream. That is their aim. That is their wish. They both are pushing for that with, honestly, an unbecoming amount of lust. Truly. It's... I don't know. There are phrases which could come to mind, none of which I want to say my little cousin's watching. Jacob, your message didn't get eaten, but I, I have no idea why you didn't get a disc Discord ping didn't come through. and yeah. I'm going to have to start doing Discord pings. <laughs> Add Discord pings onto Twitter pings and all the other things to try and make up for the fact YouTube doesn't seem to ping people. And the trouble is, for the, the, with the pol newspaper politicians seeking an easy scapegoat, you have the fact that the fisher Beresford dispute starts to come in place, with both sides believing that if they discredit Battenberg and they get rid of him, they'll get their own candidate into power. They will. I don't think Beresford was actually called back for anything to do with World War One. Um... No, Beresford is an MP till 1916. And then he's made a member of laws. He, he, he's basically... Um, Beresford is Chief Sea Scout. And working together with Baden Powell to devise this training scheme for the Sea Scouts. That's what he's doing. He is, get, doesn't get anything to do with World War One. And they don't. The thing is, neither of them wants to be commander of the Grand Fleet. They know they can't do that. They know they're too old. They can't get command of the Grand Fleet. So the only post they can get glory in is his first Sea Lord. That's the fighting post of the Admiralty. Running the war. Being in charge. And honestly. Well, Beresford actually ends up having been put down by Churchill, even. Um, because Bear Churchill had responded to uh, earlier when Bridgerman retire, uh, uh, res uh, resigned. Churchill responded to Beresford saying, Since I became First Lord of within a fortnight, he made a speech in which he said, I betrayed the Navy. And ever since, he's been going on about going about the country, pouring out charges of espionage, favoritism, blackmail, fraud, and inefficiency. The noble lord nourishes many bitter animosities on naval matters. Um... He really had to go to town to him, and Beresford, uh, Churchill actually does go to town on Beresford to try and stop him doing the attacks on Battenberg during World War I, but it doesn't really stop him. Beresford thinks he can do it, and he's a big enough idiot to try. Now, the big problem really for those factions is whilst Louis had traditionally supported Fisher in terms of being very much in favour of technical education, technical improvement services. As a second Sea Lord, he'd done a great job for the Navy in terms of improving its training and readiness for war. As in his various posts, he'd done a lot of good work for improving the exercise and the quality of training going on with the fleets. And he had really supported the technological, but he was different in one key way. Louis basically becomes a target for both the Fisher and the Beresford factions. And this is despite, and I'm quoting directly Fisher, he is the most capable administrator in the Admiral's list by a long way. And that's really what we want for a Seedle to be. Uh, he is absolutely besieged from all sides. He is, you know, 
the thing is, as I mentioned several points, he had been questioned by MPs his entire career over his German birth. It was nothing new. I've got a good quote somewhere here. Um, yes, uh, the Liberal MP Charles Cunibert, um questioned Bamberg's appointment to HMS Dreadnought in 1886, I think, roughly. Um, and he asked, what special qualifications have entitled a foreigner to be promoted over the heads of some 30 British officers? Well, uh, for the for then First Lord of the Admiralty, um, Lord George Hamilton, responded, Captain Severson, who commands the Dreadnought, applied for Prince Louis of Bamberg to fill the appointment. I may add that another officer who is about to command a large ironclad in the Mediterranean has made a similar application. He then added that 22 uh, commanders, junior to Bamberg, held similar appointments. And you can find it all very nicely in the Parliamentary Debates in Hansard from 1887. 2nd of August 1887. And just go and search Louis Bandberg and it comes up. It's quite fun. Um, there's all sorts of interesting things that come about. Fisher is certainly not a team player. Dan Herman, will Reef Fisher lurk in the background after fin uh, finishing his term in the first season? Wasn't Trench like, like this for the RAF? Yes, he was. Now, one of the interesting things is that because of his qualities and qualifications, the Navy actually, for the whole war, tells him that he might well return to command position post-war and actually could be recalled during war if they needed him. And so he is an honourable man and, realising this, does not wish to take on any posts, which means during the war he earns barely any money. And this is a problem because this continues until December 1918, and so he turns down company directorships, he turns down all the officers of anything he could do, and it eventually ends up having him, him having to sell his home, Kent House, in 1919 for financial reasons. So he's literally made a pauper, in, in, you know, in equivalent terms, not a pauper by probably modern, by being a pauper, but he's made to force to sell his home because he keeps being told he's going to get a post, but he's never given one. In fact, there's even an argument that he might have been going to be offered a post by Fisher, and that was one of the uh, one of the sort of quiet agreements that was going on when he got uh, when he went, and that was the thing of okay, fine, I'm fed up with fighting this, I'll go, but you're going to give me a seagoing command, okay, I'll take it, because he was. Whilst he was old, he wasn't too old for a seagoing command in 1914. If you think about that, he'd been born in 1854, so he's 1914, he's 60. He could, he could still carry on. He could take a seagoing post even at this point. Got a couple of years left. So, how could he survive? This is the next interesting topic. How can I make him survive and how does it change things? Well, if Fish is not there, because let's say he's gone suddenly, then it's Beresford versus the it's Beresford team versus the Fisher team. And the Fisher team wouldn't have the suitable figurehead. Jellicoe's running the Grand Fleet and he won't want to move from there. And he's really the next senior that's really acceptable to all the fish rights. There's no one else of senior for, uh, senior position enough to really be pushed into it. So by default, they probably coalesce around Louis because he'd be suitable. Um, Fisher going actually makes 
if he goes in January 1914. Churchill probably uses Beatty as his sounding board, but Beatty's far too junior to be promoted to the first Sea Lord. And also, in the nicest way, Vandenberg can control Beatty in ways that he couldn't, can, can never control Fisher. For example, he could put Beatty in a ship a long way away from home. He can't do that with Fisher. He could put BT in places where he can't get information out and in easily enough. So, whilst that probably happens, that's a far easier situation for Battenberg to quietly manage. Combine that with the King's support, and I think Beresford finds himself in his campaign going the same way all those other campaigns have gone. If he doesn't have the, if he hasn't got both factions to deal with in the navy fighting him, so he's got the moderates will probably still coalesce to him, and he's got the extremes of the Fisher side coalescing to him, then that means he's got enough weight of opinion behind him that's probably going to help, and people are just going to see Beresford just trying to campaign for it. Combine that with the king's support and Churchill actually hopefully listening to Battenberg, and things become very different. And remember, this is Fisher dying in January 1914. So he's not just happened to die, he's died a long time before the war begins, which gives a lot of time for things to work through. There's also quite the possibility that with his sounding board gone, etc., that Churchill slips into one of his black dog days, as he calls it, and um, loses his post, but we'll leave that to one side. And so, oh, good point. Really scummy of the Navy not to give Vanberg a post after war. I wonder if he gets recorded at some point. Basically, after the war, he's told, can you please resign for the good of the Navy because they need to promote some other people. I'm sure Jellico would have been most disappointed to learn that BT had been appointed to, I don't know, command the Australia squadron. <laughs> um. Let's see. Uh, l let me just find exactly when he gets that one. Um, da -da -da -dee, dee, 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 dee. Uh, he's naval secretary of the First Lord of the Admiralty until 1913. He's rear admiral commanding Sixth Cruiser Squadron until 1912. Vice admiral commanding First Battle Cruiser Squadron in 1913. So you need to find him a vice admiral post somewhere. Oh, happy days. <laughs> That's not difficult. Do you want the Mediterranean fleet, BT? <laughs> Send him out to the Mediterranean and get rid of him. Uh, the Far East. There's so many different places to send him. Oh. Send him to America to be the senior naval attache in the Americas. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but no, there there are ways to manage it. There are ways to manage it. Hello, Runon. So. The point is this. The problem for Louis and Badenberg wasn't that he was being attacked. It was that he was being attacked from all sides. He traditionally, and very successfully, managed to play factions off against each other. So when all the factions are trying to attack him, that's when he's in trouble. That's his problem. Because, at that point, he has no support base to build from. 
And he's not the type of leader who's going to rouse the fierce emotions that Fisher and the anti-Fishers Beresfords do. Because whilst he's a good and capable leader, he is not a loud, outspoken one. That's not his style. So with that all in place, and there being a very good chance of his survival, because of the reality of Fisher team, etc., then we have to consider what is the chances, what happens in terms of the war. Well, let's talk about war beginning and historically some of the issues we have. Historically, the staff he's put together to try and run the Admiralty falls apart at the beginning of the war. It falls apart for three reasons. One, it's divided with people fighting over Fisher, uh, of Fisher versus Beresford and being drawn into the factions. Two, he loses a lot of capable officers to the Grand Fleet, which he knew was happening, but still he underestimated the impact that would uh, cause. And that is on him. Mostly because he felt that the the officers who would stay were going to be better than they turned out to be. So, again, that could be down to the factionism that came in. Three, he gets distracted by having to spend a lot of his time defending his position. And his personal and his post. And because of the wear that all takes in, upon him, including dealing with his boss being an, a bit of an idiot... He isn't really running on all cylinders, and it, as historically, it slightly falls apart by October 20, 14, 1914. Now, what would uh, Battenberg have done if he'd been advising Churchill and Churchill actually been listening? Well, we do know that Battenberg manages to work out with Churchill that the fleet doesn't get sent home from its exercises. It gets held together. And that's probably one of the most famous decisions they make at the beginning of the conflict, before the conflict even happens. The fleet is, is formed up and is put together and is post. Now, one of the interesting things was, instead of dispersing the fleet, you know, what else could they have done? Well... Here is the point which Andrew Lambert would make, is if Fish had been in charge, the fleet would have been wielded more. It would have been used more aggressively. It would have been oh, sent to Belgium or sent to Germany. And I do agree with him. If Fisher was in charge, there certainly would be that kind of scenario. I think if Banberg had had more confidence in his advice being listened to, I think there would have been a difference also in how the fleet might have been used. If he didn't have to spend his time arguing against some of the advice that Fisher gave for where to position the fleet. Because the trouble is, here's this is the thing. Fisher wants to do a very aggressive route. No one else in the cabinet wants to do that aggressive approach. And whilst that approach might well have worked as a deterrent for war and might have been successful, if the cabinet aren't wholeheartedly behind it, there is no point in doing it. And you can advise a cabinet all you want, but they're not going to do something they don't want. So what would they want to do? What could you do with the fleet in such a way that could affect things? Well, the interesting thing about Bamberg is we actually have an idea of what he might have done. Because he talks about it at certain points, and he seems to consider it. I think... Myself. He wanted to do something subtle but obvious. So, that gives you a couple of options. The fleet has been sketch, has been uh, retained in in organisation from its exercise. It hasn't been dispersed back to its. Uh, normal, uh, normal, d and ordinary commission, ordinary posts. You know, decommissioned into ordinary and all those things. I think perhaps if you send that fleet on a big cruise, you send the whole fleet on a cruise. You don't hoist it off the coast of Germany. It does a cruise down the length of the North Sea and turns up in the Channel. Maybe visits the Thames Estuary or something like that, and then cruises back, a cruise, does a whole cruise around the UK. 
a big crew. Or something like that. So it's not gone far away. So it's still there for if you need it. But you do a big, big statement of, look how big and how mighty our fleet is. And you do a lot of press attention on it. Make sure everyone understands the fleet is being kept very ready and is at full alert and full viability for war. Maybe do a firing demonstration as you pass through the channel. Nicely in the view of the, ch of the continental coast. Yes, the French will see it. But the French are our entente. Cordial partners. And so they'll be reassured by it. But their own papers talking about the huge crescendo of guns. The mighty rush of fire. Will hopefully make the point. But I do not see war being stopped by it. I don't. Um, you see, the thing is, I do consider Fisher's methodology might have stopped war. It could also have started it earlier and in different ways. And made the Allies seem the aggressors. That is the trouble with good, with good deterrence. Is that you have to judge it by the situation. So you can go for a slightly more nuanced approach, i.e. the big crews around the UK... As your approach, you can go for the least path of least resistance, which is just keeping the fleet together approach. Or you can go for the fleet turning up on your coast of your enemy approach. And the thing is, the fleet turning up on the coast of the enemy will, I, will do one of two things. It will either start the war, or it will cut the war off before it begins. It can go either way. It's... It's a scenario. Now, the other thing which you start to see is, well, Sturdy's running quite a lot of the staff work and positioning some of the fleet, but there's no one really senior paying attention over his, ba over his back shoulder checking on him. And this is the thing, if Vandenberg hadn't been quite as, as so distracted, if there hadn't been the falling apart there had been, I do not see how you get the Battle of Coronel happening as it did historically. Because Ivor Battenberg, who's a fairly competent admiral, would go, no, we need to reinforce Craddock. And tell Craddock not to do anything until the reinforcements arrive. Or you would never have Craddock being so exposed in the first place. Because remember, Craddock has a pre-dreadnought that doesn't work. All sorts of issues. And the forces have been spread out all around the place to cover everywhere. And... There's no point. You've got a choke point in the Falkland Islands. Why are you not putting the forces there? Why are the forces going to different places around the South American coast? Do you really think that Shan Horse and Nisenau, these are the, of course, World War One era armoured cruisers, can do that wider swing out round the, uh, into the Atlantic to go up to get back there on their fuel supplies? No. And certainly not their other ships. There is a possibility Craddock might have had a battle cruise with him. I'm not quite sure about that. Maybe one of the Invincibles, potentially. But I think it's far more likely he has things like HMS Defence with him. And as we've been over before, HMS Defence, the 1907 Minotaur class um, armoured cruiser, well, with her four 9.2 inch guns and a well, five, seven and a half inch gun broadside. Mm, with the other two armor cruisers in Craddock's, the Craddock squadron, that's going to make a difference. Because it means that at Coronel, mm, Craddock suddenly has a lot more firepower there to support him. That uh, defense on her own would have been a firepower boost. Perhaps getting a battle cruiser coming down as well, that would have been very helpful, but I think, honestly, defence would have been enough. Uh, there could well have been other ships there as well. I think you might have found that the scenario was, well, they've got two. One of the, 
okay, let me put this this way. So, we know Battenberg has certain ideas on how the Royal Navy should manage scenarios. We know this and partially because sometimes it's being referred to by people even like Henderson later on in the 1920s and 30s. And if you consider in World War II, what was the practice the Royal Navy had? You have two ships, we turn up with four ships. Okay? So, the scenario of Coronel is very antithetical to the Royal Navy's pre-policy, pre-World War I policy, their rest of their policy during World War I, and their post-World War I policy. Why? Because you have two armoured cruisers versus two armoured cruisers. I sincerely doubt that if Battenberg had been paying attention and being able to run the staff like he'd wanted to run it and hadn't been dealing with all this fuss and had been able to shut down Beresford quickly and hadn't had Fisher as well piling in, I'm fairly certain Von Spey finds himself up against a Craddock who has four armoured cruisers at least there. And that makes a big difference because historically he had two armoured cruisers, a light cruiser and an auxiliary cruiser there. If he'd had a couple of light cruisers, the auxiliary cruiser, and four armoured cruisers, there is no chance of Von Spey winning that fight. Because the odds are, whilst, yes, he would still have Good Hope and Monmouth, I highly doubt he doesn't have Good Hope and Monmouth. I think he'd have Defence, and I think he'd probably have another similar level armoured cruiser. So defence is a Minotaur class. I wouldn't have been surprised, honestly, if you found either Warrior, Cochrane, Achilles or Natal showing up, i.e. one of the Warrior class armoured cruisers, which again are war wandering around but are usually attached to the Grand Fleet and various things, but I think, yeah, well, one of them could have been sent. Because some of them were also in the Mediterranean. And I also think you would have found things like the battle cruisers deployed to the Mediterranean earlier on to manage Goban. That's where you need a battle cruiser. So the battle cruisers should have there should have been the battle cruisers there earlier to manage Goban. Again, this is staff work. This is normally where Battenberg in his career has absolutely shone. Staff work, administration, naval intelligence, uh, uh, all these things. And it's only because his staff is absolutely breaking down due to infighting, and only because he himself is being overwhelmed by being attacked from all sides, that it doesn't happen. I'm not saying he's going to get everything 100% right, but I think you're going to find a lot more of the right pieces turning up in the right places, which gives you a better chance. Now, Knight 6831, Denmark in 90, straight in 1941 is not 2v2 because Bismarck and Prince Jürgen are a battleship and a cruiser versus a battleship, a fast battleship, and a battle cruiser. So that should be an overwhelming power. Plus, there are two heavy cruisers nearby. So it's not a 2v2. The fact that two of the two heavy cruisers aren't allowed to join in the fight, it should have been two heavy cruisers versus a heavy cruiser and two capital ships versus a capital ship. So the fact is that is the commander of, of HMS, that's the, the admiral there making a choice. And that's not the right choice. Um, my goodness, the battle cruisers were in a med in war, but Mill had them in the wrong place. Again, that's staff work. They're not in the right place, and there aren't enough of them. If you think about it, Milne has them quite carefully to cover get the Goban getting back to, to the German fleet, to try and go through the Straits of Gibraltar, which is sensible. But the thing is, you need probably two more, or two more sitting in there, to have them the other side to cover if, it goes for, if they try and go the other way. That's the scenario you're dealing with. You see, it's sensible staff work to have the two to cover the because you don't want them going out to you don't want them going out to Atlantic, and that's where the position to cover. But you need to think it through and hang on. Well, actually, could they go anywhere else? They can't. The idea was well, you don't need more than two because you've got the Suez Canal, so they can't go out the other way. The thing is, they can go to the Black Sea, so you need something to cover that way. 
Queen Mary was in the Caribbean. Yeah. Queen Mary's in the Caribbean. So theoretically, she could have been down with Craddock. Black Marxists, the British didn't need to station black, uh, uh, battle cruisers throughout the Empire to manage the German battle cruisers. Where would have German battle cruisers based? They're all based in the North Sea. And so they don't need to station them. And also, to be honest, the British are using light cruisers more than battle cruisers for those duties. Night 6, 8 through 1. Two things. One, this is not a discussion of the Battle of Denmark Straits today. So, in nicest way, you're going off topic again. We're talking about Hood. And I know it's your favourite topic, but this is a different discussion today. Two, and this is important. Those heavy cruisers are not irrelevant to the fight. They're not included in the fight by the orders of the Admiral at the time. So, yeah. They're not too far away. They could have got closer if they, if they, but they're ordered to back off. So we won't go into that. That is, a, that is not the thing of though. Say, that's not the same as saying they're not there, and it's also not the same as saying the Prince Eugen is suddenly equivalent to a battle cruiser in its fighting capabilities. And I do realise it's on me for having given you an opportunity to bring up the Battle of Denmark Strait and your favourite topic of HMS Hood. I should have really phrased that and not included that point because I do know it doesn't take much to get you attracted to that topic. There's HMS Shannon is also another option. There's all sorts of options when it comes to the heavy cruisers, uh, you know, the armor cruisers where they could have uh, could have been deployed. Melanie, don't inc don't do that. Oi. So there are options for what could have been around and could have been sent. I think Queen Mary might have been in the Panama. It was in the Caribbean Pan area, just in case they tried to come through the Panama Canal. I don't see the Americans allowing them through the Panama Canal under any circumstance, but that was possibly an idea of why they were based there. But yeah, she could have been sent out. Yes, Knight 6831, I'm not getting into this. Knight 6831, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not. I know, I it was my own fault because I started you, I gave you an opening for the topic, Knight 6831, I won't get into it though. I'm not spending 10 minutes discussing this with you because you have your view on it and I have mine and that's not going to change your discussion on this channel. Now, no, because Black Maximus wouldn't have battle cruisers stationed around the Empire beside the war allowed them to quickly wipe these seas of German cruisers with minimum losses. Where are the German cruisers that need to wipe out Black Maximus? Where are they? And before you go, there is one out in the China station to deal with them. That's HMAS Australia, which is why they decide they don't want to be there, because there is a battle cruiser there. They're basically running from that battle cruiser. So where the Gerard Germans, there was a battle cruiser. Where they weren't, yeah, do you really need one? The Germans don't have a squadron in the really have any ships in the Indian Ocean. The Germans don't have any really any ships in the South Atlantic. They they're mostly merchant ships. They can be hoovered up by town class cruisers. You have lots of those. Why do you need to send a big, expensive battle cruiser out to do that? And, oh, the Germans are going to get their battle cruisers out into the North Atlantic and outrun the world. Oh, goody. That's actually a good thing. And, yeah, the latest general... The, uh, the other problem for the British is that the, the Warrior class, honestly, the Duke of Edinburgh class, the Minotaur class, all those big, uh, latest generation heavy cru uh, armoured cruisers aren't really being allowed out to do the job they want to do. Even the Devonshires aren't being allowed out to do the job they want to do.
So yeah, I think I think this changes some things. I really do. So that gets us to August 1914, some decisions taking place then. And this is sort of going back in time, but it's worthwhile considering it. Now, historically, Fisher pushes Churchill to cancel the capital ship construction because you need them. You need those spaces urgently for all sorts of things he's putting forward. You know, what happens if we have a mass casualty event with our ships and we need to repair them or we're building the wrong ships and all sorts of things he's pushing forward for it. Well, that's not that that is not Banberg's way. Remember, Banberg's been in charge of ordering all these ships, and this has actually caused the major big a major part of contention between him and Fisher, because he's not ordering enough battle cruisers. Look at them. Consider when Banberg becomes first sea lord in nineteen twelve. Consider that HMS Tiger was ordered in 1912. In fact, sort of all under construction in 1912, really. So, yeah, sort of ordered in 1911, 1912. If you look at the whole of Battenberg's career as First Sea Lord, what are the British not ordering? Battle cruisers. Yeah, they're big built, but they're all ones which were ordered before him being finished off. Battenberg doesn't like battle cruisers. He likes the idea of fast battleships. He likes the idea of a large, strong battle fleet, but he doesn't like the idea of battle cruisers. He considers them too weak for, some of the, for many of the missions the British need from them. So that's an interesting one to think about. It is a fully rigged ship, yeah, HMS Argincourt. It was one of the ships he he'd served on, and he wrote he had a really wonderful time on it. In one of the accounts I read. Um, Johnny Cake, could you see Benberg suggesting to the United States, go ahead and let Spay through the Panama Canal? No. At no point is he going to do that. Because if he did that and the Americans did it, that would make the Americans complicit to murder. Because that's what would be happening. If the battle crews are sitting waiting on the other side of the Panama Canal and they've let them through, then America's no longer neutral. So America's not going to do that and he's not going to ask them to do it. So, this is the really interesting thing. Does he cancel? If he's in charge, do they cancel the R class and Queen Elizabeth? Well, Renown and Repulse, I do not see getting rebuilt as battle cruisers. I don't see that happening. And they have to be completed anyway. So Renown and Repulse are no longer the Renown and Repulse class. They are battle. They are battleships. They are built to the R class, Revenge class, Batch Two level. So we can cross out those. Uh, then we have Resistance and Argincourt, which are being built in naval dockyards. Now, in no war prior to this had the Royal Navy ever cleared its dockyards of construction in order to repair fleets which they might have damaged in battle. I can see the logic going through for it, but in many ways it clears the space and construction requirements to get through the battle cruisers, the infrastructure. So, I think. I would say I think Resistance and Argincourt get completed. I think Resistance and Argincourt get completed. 
I would say that's going to give uh, that the interesting thing then for is what is Argincourt? Because we've been over this before. My strong and sincere suspicion is that we're looking at a fast battleship. Now, I realize Knight 6831 has already premed premeditated a lot of the points I'm going to use by writing his declaration in the chat about the faster battleship is still five to ten years at where best because there is more than having small tube boilers, there's infrastructure needed and doctrine on how to use them. Um, I, I, the, doc the infrastructure you have to support them, I'm not sure what infrastructure more you want when you're talking about the Royal Navy in 1914. There are plenty of dockyards, there are plenty of systems. We're talking about an oil or an all a completely oil fired ship that's built from the get to go as oil fired. I think fast battleship is in, within range of it and in infrastructure terms. Um, in terms of doctrine on how to use them, there is doctrine on how to use them already. This is one of the interesting things. Again, when you talk about the Royal Navy, the US Navy doesn't really have a fast capital ship doctrine at this point. But the Royal Navy does, and one of the things they've been talking about is how to use the more armoured battle cruiser, HMS Tiger, and they've been experimenting with her. And realistically, they realise very quickly, she doesn't have enough armour for some of the things they wanted to do. She can't hold in a fight long enough. So, I think what you're dealing with is... Something which is in many ways a fusion of the Tiger and the Queen Elizabeth class design. I think you are looking at something which is of that sort of scenario. And if we consider... The Queen Elizabeth class battleships are 33,000 tons in normal, 34,000 tons deeply loaded pretty much. Um, Tiger is 29,000 tons in normal. So there's a bit of a differential, and there is a lot of differential in that armour, but Tiger can do 28 knots. She has 85,000 shaft horsepower thanks to 39 water tube, or uh, 39 large boilers. Um, 24 boilers give 75,000 shaft horsepower in the Queen Elizabeth class. Considering the small tube boilers which were available and being designed by the lovely people at Yarrow's at this point, and the idea of where they could come from, I reckon you could get something with the power necessary to take a Queen Elizabeth-sized, or may probably slightly longer ship, to the 28 knots. Yeah, it would be fun to do Kickstarter someday on Twitter uh, to do to support the research time research time needed to do for HMS Sergeant Corps because it would be weeks of wandering around the country, trying to find the various archive, uh, go through the various personal archives as well. Um, the thing is, I would say. Arjun calls what he's going to put his bank in rather than doing uh, rather than changing any ships to battlecruisers. As I said he doesn't like battlecruisers. He likes fast battleships. He likes the concept of making the battleship faster. So I think you're dealing with 20 knot ship. And as said, my strong suspicion has always been that Arjun Corps was going to have 18 inch guns. And that suspicion comes from the fact the 18 inch gun appears, the triple 15 inch turret doesn't. And I realise there is a lot of stuff which comes about. But the thing is, of the 18-inch guns fitted on HMS Furious, we know, one, they look like they've been cut down. They look like they were longer than they've been cut down. So I think we're probably dealing with 42s or 45s. 18-inch guns. 18-inch um, 42 would be interesting. Basically an 18-inch version of 15-inch gun. An 18-inch 45 would be an 18-inch version of the original 
British style of 13 and a half inch gun, built out to the traditional length the British like to do, because the British like the 45 cal. Uh, a 45, you know, making it that. So they like that as a concept. I, I really do think that's the problem, the obvious one for the British to go. And I think he goes for that. Now that to me is interesting because if you consider her starting point is some point in 19... Like if she is started in probably nine, late 1913 early 1914. She's cancelled in August 1914, but some of the details around her, when she's laid down, all those things are running a bit, aren't around. I think the thing is, she hadn't been launched yet when she's cancelled. That's my strong suspicion. And if we consider it takes roughly a year to go from laying down to launching, if she's laid down in, let's go for... November 1913, she would be about a couple of months away, uh, three, two, three or four months away from launching. And then she'd be about a year away from com from commissioning. Again, if we consider what the historical thing was, roughly. Now, some of the ships, which were Malaya, for example, is a good example of this, she's delayed by war by a few months, whereas Barham is delayed by a little bit, and Valiant's delayed by a little bit, So, but we really have to look at Portsmouth, Her Majesty Dockyard Portsmouth, for our timeline, because Argincourt is being built in the same place that Queen Elizabeth was. So I think what we're looking at is a slightly longer Queen Elizabeth design, with probably an R-class armour suite, considering when she's going to be ordered, uh, maybe slightly thicker armour. Small tube boilers, because I've said before, those appear from nowhere and suddenly that they're long lead items which appear from nowhere for the courageous class. And I wouldn't be surprised if she was going to be armed with six 18 inch guns. Now that changes things. That if she's lo if she comes into service and if she's pushed into service in 1915. 1916, uh, early, uh, late 1915, early 1916, she is going to be an interesting vessel to appear on the world stage. Um, that is going to start affecting a lot of a lot of German perspectives. It's going to affect a lot of people, especially if she's 28, capable of 28 knots. And it's worthwhile enough they're going to accept some compromises to get it. I wouldn't be surprised if her deck armour is about the same as an original build Queen Elizabeth class. And so I'm talking a deck which is one to three inches thick. I, 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 there are some quite serious problems which some people raise with the idea of it. Da, 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 and I accept those problems. But I think, the, I think they could have done it if they'd been prepared to accept some compromises. And I'm fairly sure a certain the Royal Navy would have gone with that. I think Rio de Janeiro would have been named a different name. If it's not named Argincourt, it might be named Crazy. Although Crazy, Abaca and Hogue are the armor cruisers which are sunk, so doubtful it's named Crazy. Um, there'll be other names. HMS Arrow. Uh, there's all sorts of options. Maybe so in practice views are pretty much but that that was the standard for the time, okay? It, it's one of the things is people hear Fast Battleship and they compare it to the Fast Battleships in the 90, late 1930s and 1940s. No. We're talking a Fast Battleship for World War One era. And for the World War One era, the requirements are going to be roughly the armour you find on the R-Class. Um, you know, the armour you find on ships like that. Uh, the Queen is a class 1 to 3 inches, the R class decks 1 to 4 inches, so she might be 1 to 4 inches over 4 inches over things like the magazine spaces and engine spaces, but it's 
it's really it's 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 not going to be much of a massive armor scenario. I think she might if she's got 18 inch guns, she might have a 15 inch armor belt. She may have had her armor belt put up by that much, but again, the armor belt on the Queen Elizabeth class is only 13 inches. The armor belt on the R class is only 13 inches, and they got 15 inch guns. So don't expect it to be a 18 inch belt or something like that. Hello, Sean Mac. And hello, John Luke. Um, glad you're here. Um, nice to get everyone. No, Renan and Repulse do not get completed as battle cruisers. They get completed as battleships. I put this there so you know what historically were built and what historically were cancelled. I would say in this timeline, they don't get cancelled. You don't get the battle cru uh, Renan and Repulse being built as battle cruisers. And honestly, again, if Argincourt has gone the fast battleship route and you see any of the issues start turning up in the black in the battle cruiser fleet as historically, that's gonna push it. As he's not the HMS Fisher, perhaps. Uh, Black Mouse was free twin guns. I've got a picture of her at the end. Before you go, there are entire videos on this channel dedicated to the HMS Argentina and the theory I have about her and explaining that. So I, I, I will refer you to go look in those videos for more information and I will show a picture of her, a picture of her at the end because I have a running a running profile of her on the Ultimate and Adrenaline which I update to try and make it as accurate as I think it could be every time we have, that they have a um, update. And I have to say, I think that only has a 14-inch armor belt. So pretty much the Royal Navy in this point are getting 8R class and 6 Queen Elizabeth class, of which one could well be modified with 18-inch guns. Now, what did he think about carriers? Well, carriers aren't really a factor at this point. He had supported the procurement uh, of, uh, of the seaplane carriers. And he might well push in some aircraft carriers. He's going to listen to the event, events. In many ways, Battenberg is like Jellico in that regard. He was a very, is very much professional. And he's going to push for that. No, I've not changed it. I've not changed it because in the point I would make, and this is the thing is, you're talking, uh, the, 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 when Fisher cancels these ships, he's cancelling Battenberg ships. These are the ships which the Third Sea Lord and Battenberg, as First Sea Lord, have pushed through. So Fisher's happy to cancel them, but for Battenberg, because they don't represent his thinking, but they do represent Battenberg's thinking. So that's the scenario. And 9681, things could well change. But again, do they become the liabilities? And, you know, I've done a video about the R class, revenge class, on this channel. And I would argue strongly against them being liabilities. So, yeah. Well, Black Maxwell, this is the point as we go on. If the if Queen Elizabeth is this 18-inch gunship, and I'm going from my own strong suspicions here, okay? And as I, I, I to give you a precy of what I put in the larger videos about her, one of the reasons she is you that is used for her cut and cancellation is she's complicated, and they cannot finish her quickly enough. Because she's complicated. Now the thing is, you're talking about a yard which already built HMS Queen Elizabeth the first in the class. So building the last in the class is not exactly going to be a complicated issue for them. Because they've done it all before. So that means she's had changes. And this is the point at which that me and Drac get into our friendly debate over it. Drac and I have a call. 
Um, uh, many of you will have seen recently that someone decided to name a video as me when it was him. And I had great fun with it. I got lots of messages going, that's not you. No, it's not. Uh, that was fun. Um, but no, uh, one of the scenarios they said that the sit go for is, it, would it be free... Because we're fairly sure it's going to be faster. We both agree that. They, that it's the only project for which capital ship size small tube boilers could have been ordered for. There is only one ship, one timeline, which makes sense for them suddenly appearing when they appear in the form they appear, ready to go for Courageous and Glorious. Yeah. And, you know, that appears. So we know that. And then the other thing that appears is 18-inch guns on HMS Furious. Well, they're building guns, and they suddenly appear and are available. Those aren't battleship-grade guns, though. Those have been cut down. And they built at least three. Now, if I was building for, let's say, a battleship which is going to have six guns... I'd want to build in batches of three, and I'd probably want to build 12 of them. And order three to start with. Then I'd order another six, and then I'd order another three. Commerce disabled, so wasn't able to go... Yeah, I know. They, they, it was fun, that video. They've changed it now back. Uh, but they've now revealed his full real name, which he's for years hidden. And I went, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't hidden very well, mate. <laughs> <sighs> now, the thing is, you have these ships built. You're going to change. You've got, you see, you've got all that information running around. You've got all that factor running around. So that makes sense to me that Argincourt, this sixth Art of Queen Elizabeth class, which is suddenly tacked on the end as an extra Queen Elizabeth, when they'd always been ordering five, always ordering five, and suddenly a sixth one gets added on. In late 1913. Yeah, that that's suspicious. And that fits the timeline for the other stuff appearing and what's on the remarks about it. So, yeah, I think 18, Argincourt is an 18-inch gun ship. Now, I would also say this, and I know Knight 6831 is making a campaign in the chat for this, but here's the thing. Battenberg wouldn't care about the battle cruiser fleet in terms of bolstering at this point. As far as he's concerned, they've got enough ships. He, uh, Tiger was completed. He has specifically not ordered battle cruisers while he's been first, sea, or first Lord of the Admiralty. He's specifically not done it. So I don't think he does any kind of scenario where he completes two and two. Why would he want to? The whole reason actually that Fisher even gets them through after he's be proved to be too successful with his winning his case for no more capital ships is because oh, he makes the justification that the they can't get out of the contract so they might as well build something better with it. I reckon it's a 42 to 45 count. It's well, one of those. 42 would be the easiest to shorten to a 40, so it's most likely a 42. But the traditional British is a 45 cal. So, and the tradition, and when you're looking at the N3, etc., they're talking about a 45 cal. So, I would. that That's the whole debate. And this is another reason why it goes down to a six gun ship, and slightly longer, because that makes sense with the length of the guns. Now, the other interesting thing is, I, I think one of the things you might see with Battenberg, especially due to his career in naval intelligence, is you might see things like the Flower Class Sloop Project begin earlier. He also is behind a lot of the ideas which lead to, and this is informally, which lead to the monitor productions. This is after, of course, what happens with the fleet, and that's mainly support Flanders, etc. 
So, yeah, I think his fleet deployments are pretty darn good. And I think his capabilities are going to be down. I don't think he's going to have an overwhelming number of battlecruisers. Now, the interesting thing is going to be, therefore, what happens with the next class, the Admiral class. Now, if Argincourt is an 18-inch gunship, the British aren't going to back down. If she's an 18-inch gun fast battleship, then the Admirals would be 18-inch gun fast battleships. What does that mean characteristically? What am I saying when I'm saying this? What, what do I think is coming? Well, honestly, what I would say in that scenario is if we consider... That Hood is built with 24 Yarrow Voilers and gains 144,000 shaft horsepower. And a top speed of 32 knots. On her displacement and weight. Now, if you were aiming for 28 knots. And you built it with... The, you could probably build it with the armor profile. But it would still be that length. And that size. And this is, this is one of the points you have to think about. A fast battleship is going to be longer than a battle uh, than a pure battleship. It is going to depend on what happens at Jutland. But again, here's the thing: if you're already going down the fast battleship route, and your battle cruisers get severely mauled at Jutland, do you build more battle cruisers, or do you go? Well, this shows the underlying problem in the battle cruiser design in the modern warfare. This is why we need to build fast battleships. What would you do? You're gonna to go to the, you're gonna to go to the latter option. It's the far. You get to blame a dead man. You get to blame Fisher. You get to say he was right for his time, but the world's moved on. There have been so many advances in the last ten years that no longer is the battle cruiser concept sensible. We must go to fast battleship route. Johnny K. Would Battenberg stop with one margin core, or would he order more? Well, this is, of course, the question. My, my, my scenario, uh, in my scenario, I think the Admirals are fast battleships, and they are 18-inch gunned armed vessels. Um, my Cooch, the problem with that is that Argent core very much, if she did... Uh, I have done this work, and I know this much on her. She's very much a project of Jellico and Battenberg. Um, both of them seem to be quite heavily involved with her, as did the current third Sea Lord of the time. So, honestly, I think, uh, especially as I'm not sure if BT would still be in position, as said earlier, there is a good chance that if he's causing too much trouble with Churchill, he finds himself deployed elsewhere in the world. I wouldn't be surprised if you find that the person getting Argincourt as his flagship is one... Sir John Jellicoe. Um, Admiral class could well be going for an 18 inch. Um, uh, she might be just, they might be just as long. An Admiral class battle, uh, uh, because let's be honest, if they've got 18 inch guns, they're going to need to be longer proportionally anyway than a 15 inch gun design. So an 18 in eight 18 inch gun ship with four twin turrets is going to be longer than an equivalent ship in 15 inch, and it's going to probably aim for 28 knots. So yes, um, Jutland and the Hood are not linked in this scenario. Well, that uh, we'll be getting to that. But the thing is, Hood was being built before Jutland. This is the point in a nice way. They are ordered in 1915. They're laid down at the beginning of 19... In September 1916, November, October 1916 is when the Hood, Anson, Howe and Rodney are, named, are laid down. So... Because uh, they're being worked on in 1915. I think if they are fast battleship designs, they're very different than they are in terms of what happens to them post-Jutland experience than prior to... Uh, than the battle cruiser designs. Because basically the battle cruiser, the two-word version of the admirals which had been what fisher had been pushing gets converted into a battle cruiser one word 
So at the limit, you either have them being built as a battle cruiser, one word, which in case they can be evolved into a fast battleship, or if they're already a fast battleship design with 18-inch guns, then they're going to go, well, hang on, that works, because this has got more armor. This has got more protection than those battle cruisers had. And Knight's Ignorant, yeah, someone pointed out they shouldn't have been a Jutland in the first place. I would agree, but the thing is, that was the pro that was the experience and what historically happened. So you have to expect that history to still affect the design practice. We'll be getting into this, though, as time goes on. But I, I do honestly think that if Argencore comes into service, uh, she's going to be pretty darn cool. And I think this is another interesting thing. You have the North Sea Raids in November 1914, December 1914. How does he react to that? Well, Fisher famously reacts by almost ignoring it to an extent and by positioning ships around the UK and trying to move various forces south, except, uh, you know, to Recife. So they're better positioned uh, to the Firth and Fourth um, area, so they are better positioned to engage. The battlecruiser fleet gets moved, etc. Or rather, the battlecruiser squadrons get moved, then eventually called the battlecruiser fleet after some various victories and battles. And honestly, I don't see that changing much. As said, my sus I have a suspicion that BT might not be in charge of the battlecruisers if he's been talking to Churchill behind Battenberg's back. He might well have found himself moved elsewhere. Um, but... The reality is... Ooh, I only have one bottle of iron brew left. Oh, good lord, I'm running low. The reality is, for a lot of the pro scenarios, which the fleet will be finding themselves in, a 28-knot fast battleship will do the job. And so that will start fixing things. Now, the interesting thing is going to be, do they try and push for a 30-knot fast battleship or something? That's going to be the interesting scenario. But as said, I think the Admirals become 18-gun fast battle, 18-inch gun fast battleships. And I think with this scenario going on with the raids, that's what Battenberg would use. I think also, uh, to sort of to back that up, I think Bamberg would also use... I'm going to put this politely. He would probably use these raids. Uh, it might well be the excuse he needs to change his name. Or rather, the king might encourage him to change his name to something, to Mount Baden. He did consider other options uh, before he went with Mount Baden, but remember, the king changes his name later in the war, but other people start changing as earlier, and after these raids, there's probably going to be more problems in the House of Commons, so he's probably going to need to change it. Change it. Could the Royal Navy submarines be used to uh, ambush the German raiding forces? That was actually the plan, and there were some submarines around, but they just didn't manage to get in a position in time. The trouble is, submarines are really not fast when they're below the water, and on the surface, they they can get beaten up. Now, I would say this. Uh, one of the things you also might see, because... <sighs> Bamberg was a real fan, in many ways, of the flotilla defence scheme, which Fisher had pushed forward, and Bamberg had pushed that forward as well a bit. A fair, actually, a fairly large chunk. And he was, in, he was very keen on the larger destroyers. So you might see a large destroyer class start being mass-produced. Now, what do I mean by large destroyer? Can I get the picture up? Uh, 
coming. I know what's done. So, I think it's probably 28 knots, 6 18 inch guns, and animals are improved. Yes. Especially if Arjun Core doesn't quite make a 28 knots. If, let's say, she falls short, use 27 half knots, something like that, they're going to push even harder to get them uh, uh, up to it. Um. Oh. This is the trouble with having quite so many destroyer pictures and destroyers in my folder. <laughs> oh, good lord. I, I honestly haven't planned about three different other books on the world on Royal Navy destroyers. Um, I honestly do not have... Um, a huge number of these things. Um... I, I, I honestly do not have... Oh, God. <laughs> oh, you have 200 folders in your... 200 folders in your pictures... In your destroyer pictures research folder. Okay. <laughs> Which one's the one I'm looking for? <laughs> oh, good Lord. Uh... Oh, I have complete... Um... Nice six eight three one. You're always talking about it. HMS Swift. Yes, that's it. I think that is the right one, isn't it? That is the right one. Um, da -da 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 -da. um I think Swift is the right one. Yes. HMS Swift, the destroyer leader. She'd, of course, been roughly 1,854 tons. And her 1917 reefer even gave her a 6-inch gun. The thing is, I think... Because Bamberger quite liked her idea. He quite liked her design. And I'm saying this from some of the work which was done around the time. I wouldn't be surprised if they put... If they pushed forward with some more large destroyers. And the reason you go for large destroyers is because you want a strong enough ships that a flotilla of them can stand up to enemy, uh, can push through enemy light cruisers and get aim torpedoes at the, ta at the capital ships, at the battle cruisers. And you want ships which can deal with that in any weather. And the trouble for a lot of the British response forces, because one of the things that's often misunderstood about the North Sea Raids is the British have a lot of forces which they're trying to get there, but they can't get there through the weather. A lot of them are trapped in harbour by the weather because they're just not big enough to get out. And this is a big problem for the Royal Navy in interwar years because they're going, we would really like something bigger. <laughs> yeah, I did have... And by the way, HMS Swift is a cool-looking ship. I'm going to get bring a picture up now. Uh, she was launched in 1907, and... Yeah, I have... I'm not sure if I'm supposed to use this picture or not, but I'm going to use it, so... Um, uh, please, no one tell the Imperial War Museum I'm doing this. I, I don't know if I'm allowed to use this on the screen or not, but there you go. There is HMS Swift. Isn't she gorgeous? I'm going to do that because it allows you to better see her. Um, yeah, so this is what a large 1907 destroyer looks like. Notice the free file arrangement. She's also fast. In fact, with a speed of 34 knots, she's a perfect destroyer for escorting a fast battleship of 28 knots. Just putting that out there. It fits with the scenario. Potentially, twin turrets. Um, her 1917 refit sees her get 6-inch gun. A single 6-inch gun forward. But I think a... Nine, uh, uh, I think if you are building a 19... A 19, late 1914, early 1915 version of a larger destroyer. 
you're you're probably talking about all sorts of interesting other things. HMS Verdun, I'm fairly sure you get built. Because, if I remember correctly, you are a V-Class destroyer. And yeah, they are built en masse. So yes, the V-Class, the, the smaller destroyers still get built. But I think you can see far more of these larger destroyers as well. And as said, I am fairly certain you see things like the sloops being ordered, the flower class sloops of mine. Because again, one of the interesting things about Fisher like to read intelligence reports. Badenberg had actually written intelligence reports and actually got them. One of the interesting things about Badenberg, which is a really cool fact, which people often well don't really sort of know much about is when he joins Naval Intelligence in about 1902, because he's there until 1905, from memory, he immediately uses all his contacts in the Royal Houses of Europe to start asking them about their navies. He is absolutely shameless. He uses all the contacts he can get, every single one of his personal contacts, to get the information out. And suddenly... All these wonderful lines of reports start appearing. All sorts of information starts getting into British Naval Intelligence. And at one point, I think it was Fisher, I think he was the first Sea Lord at the time, turned around and go, where's this information coming from? Why are we suddenly knowing all this? And it was turned out it was Louis of Battenberg who was writing to his family going, I hear you're ordering some new destroyers, or I hear you've got a brand new cruiser. What's it like? As a Navy man, you know how interested I am in these things. It was shameless. Absolutely shameless. Uh, yes, and Fisher was the first sea lord of the time. And Fisher was just going, where is this information coming from? It's Britannia. Cody, yes, the RNs at Pax of Angry King Gardens I couldn't escape the harbors and stuff, the enemy popsicle sticks. Honestly, don't joke. Seriously, some of their motor torpedo boat crews were trying. I mean, there is a report of one motor torpedo boat which tried to race the waves to get out the harbour, ended up being picked up by a wave and landed on the um, on the um, key. So he's reversed, reversed George from Blackadder. Yes. It's it's just it's a skill. Um, mm, potentially, potentially the five point five inch gun. Now, so we get to Gallipoli. And here is where we get another interesting fact come up. Because if Gallipoli's plan with Battenberg as First Sea Lord, there's going to be a big difference. Because rather than having an adversarial relationship with the army, where he enjoys and exists to piss them off, excuse the French, where he spends his time having fights with them and political fights engaging in trying to dominate them... He actually has a very good relationship with the army. This is scary. Fish of uh, Battenberg actually gets on with most of the chiefs of staff and most of the generals. He can get them usually to support his arguments. He's worked with them. You know, his career, and again, this is something, he is in many ways the far better wartime person to be leading the fleet because he actually gets on with all the people he needs to actually work with. As a captain, he had been the adv naval advisor to the Inspector General of Fortifications, a post which normally results in the army hating you for life. Because you go around all their fortifications and explain how your heavy artillery can smash them. 
In fact, the phrase that's often used to describe is traditionally, there's a great deal of friction caused between the two services by the post. But, Prince George, the Duke of Cambridge, the grandson of King George III and a cousin of Queen Victoria, a senior person connected with the army at this point and various other posts, actually wrote to him afterwards. You have produced a mutual feeling of goodwill and unanimity which I've always wished to see established, and by which, you're, by your tact and sound judgment, you've brought about to the fullest extent. In fact, he goes further. He really does go further. And I really cannot recommend enough going and reading Mark Keir's Prince Louis Bannenberg book, because it was published in 1934. If you can get a decent copy of it, it's written by Admiral Mark Edward, Edward Frederick Kerr, uh, who was all sorts of interesting posts, including Commander-in-Chief of the British Adriatic Squadron in 1916 and um, uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Royal Hellenic Navy in the early part of the First World War. Uh, he wrote writes a book about him, and the book is full of... The army actually liked this guy. They actually worked with him. So here's the thing. Imagine if the first events of Gallipoli, and we've talked about this before, instead of the Navy trying to force it on their own, if they'd been landing troops at the same time. Imagine what would have happened if instead of those fortifications and those minefields being able to hold them back, they'd also been dealing with soldiers being landed to come up the shores and attack them. Soldiers advancing to engage them so the forts would have to divide their fire and that would give more space for the mine clearance of ships to go through. Let alone the fact that Louis being Louis and being as invested in naval intelligence as he is would no doubt have gone, hang on. There's a minefield there. Let's figure out how we're going to get through it. And probably would have pushed forward the idea of bulging because he'd been a big, per a big part of the reason why the Royal Navy had been pushing bulging as part of its anti-mine countermeasures. So goodness knows what happens, but my only point is, there is actually an even chance that if Gallipoli still gets thought of as an idea by Churchill, even without Fisher having first suggested his Baltic plan to him, if he still comes up with Gallipoli as an idea, Battenberg's implementation of Gallipoli would be incredibly different. It might actually work. And imagine that on the effects on World War I. Okay, he's got an 18-inch gun battleship coming into service, probably in 19, late 1915, early 1916. And on top of that, Gallipoli goes well. Amos Thomas, do you know what I, I just... I did answer that question, so I don't. I hope I think I already answered what Fisher said about um, Aunt Louise Shemus gathering of information. Um, H. Well done. I'd be tempted to send BT to this campaign. A mad charger is just who you need for it, and a prominent role getting him into the battle battle cruisers. Exactly. It's actually a good thing to send him off for. It's actually where BT could be, you know, uh, BT could actually have fun. That's right. Imagine the German army sitting in the meeting wondering how to blow him right in the king <laughs> info on all their newest ships. Uh, yeah, it was... He he literally got... Uh, there is a... I, and I haven't been able to verify this, but there is a report that he got a direct report from the Kaiser himself on one of the... on some of the ships. He managed to get the Kaiser himself to send in the details of one of their ships. I'm not sure if that's true, it might be apocryphal, but I just love the fact that Kaiser Wilhelm could have been so stupid to do it, and it's believable. So, yeah.
So, you know, Gallipoli has this chance. It's you know, he has this. These all these things coming back around again. What needs is he can't be being subsumed, and I, I and besieged on all sides. But he's an effective officer, and I honestly think he could have pushed it through. He could have pushed it through, and. That's the scenario. <laughs> it seems that Vice Admiral Beatty got killed by a Turkish sniper. Deeply unfortunate than that. <laughs> was a Turkish sniper given the targeting information by Lord, ba ba <laughs> Lord Bannenberg? Uh, there's all sorts of fun things going on. And again, the point is, if this happens, if this is the thing of the war... If Gallipoli has been a success and the British have got through there, then the British can, uh, the, the Allies can be supplying Russia. Russia can start getting food and all sorts of things through the Black Sea ports. And that's a big change to the situation. Can't happen. Gallipoli actually works, so no church of resignation doesn't serve in the front. That goes hard. Potentially. Or potentially he runs a cropper of the king. But we'll leave that to one side. It's always a possibility he runs a cropper of the king. Uh, but the reality is Churchill could well be going higher. Yes. In fact, let's be honest... Asquith falls in December 1916 and is succeeded by Lloyd George. There is a chance that in 19, December 1916, when Asquith falls from leadership post, it could be, well, the choice is going to be between Churchill and Lloyd George. Lloyd George comes from the Liberals. Asquith from the Conservatives. Actually, no. He was also from the Liberals, wasn't he? Yeah. And Churchill's the Liberals as well at the third time. So, it could be Churchill. Why was I thinking Conservatives? Oh, no, that's late. That's that's the whole later thing. Yeah. Because Lloyd George ends up running a government which is mostly conserv mostly full of conservatives, which is one reason why he falls from office in 1922, because the conservatives suddenly realise, hang on, why are we propping up a liberal prime minister instead of a conservative one? Takes them a few years to realise it. Uh, the conservatives are, are, have, are always an interesting organisation. <laughs> oh, Kerr's book is uh, on Bannenberg is literally called Prince Louis of Bannenberg, and I had it out when making notes for this uh, this thing, but uh, for this presentation, but I cannot find it and now. But I do have a copy. It's published by Longman's and Gre uh, Longman's Green and Co. Um, it's a really cool book. I'll see if I can put a link to it in the chat. I'll see if I can find a link to it. Um, yeah. 
There's a copy on a books for £44. I'll put it in the chat. Now, Bamberg's thoughts on aircraft, he quite liked them. But he's, again, it's how does war change? Uh, again, there's a lot of things which change with war. The aircraft in 1912, you're not going to make specific ships for. The aircraft in 1914, you might be tempted to. And the aircraft in 1916, you will do. So I don't think anything changes in terms of aircraft procurement at this point. There might, um, again, Hermes and various other projects actually start uh, sort of when he's first sea lord. So you can argue, or could argue that pretty much that's going to continue on. They might get built more quickly, they might not. If he's not building Courageous, Glorious and Furious, who knows, who knows what he builds. If Gallipoli succeeds, does Asquith manage to stay in power? That's the other option. If Gallipoli succeeds, Asquith might well stay in power himself. Zombs. I think the Kaiser might have been a fun chap to hang out with as so long as you're willing to treat him as a boss. Um, probably. So Gallipoli is definitely interesting. Then we have the North Sea Battles. Well, it's going to depend on where BT is. If Battenberg's decided he's been annoying and sent him away to command the Gallipoli operation or something like that, then he's not in charge of these operations, and then you probably have a choice between Sturdy or Hood being in charge. Hood had been Battenberg's appointment for commanding forces in the Channel at the beginning of the war, and had proved him pretty darn right. And the thing is, having a sponsor like him around, as he's in the senior post, could be do amazing things for your career. But Dove T. Sturdy might well have coordinated other things. And there's another contender. Okay, he's come back. And it, who might well have come back. And especially if he's come back after being successful. Craddock. If Craddock has had four armoured cruisers at the Battle of Cornell, maybe Queen Mary, who knows. But probably for at least four armoured cruisers. The Battle of Cornell will have been a victory. He will have come back a glorious hero. Does anyone get, think he doesn't get promoted to Vice Admiral in that scenario? And then you have to pick someone to command the battle cruisers? Well, who better but the conquering hero? If Beatty's gone away to Gallipoli, and I will accept that's a pretty good place to post him in 1915, then the odds are you have Craddock in charge of the battle cruisers. Now, the really interesting thing is, as Verdun is pointing out, Jellica might not even fight at Jutland, assuming it even happens, because Sturdy, Craddock, and Hood are not going to leave the, the, uh, be without the Queen Elizabeth. Well, that is the interesting thing. Uh, they might coordinate their forces better. Craddock might well go, I don't want to stick away from my battleships, the Queen Elizabeth class, if he's got them. Uh, same with Sturdy. Hood is definitely not that type. So there are all sorts of options. There's also a scenario whereby, and this can be interesting, can have a knock-on consequences. What happens if these battles tend to show that the uh, state of battlecruiser gunnery is interesting? But more importantly, the Battle of Dogger Bank. Famously, there is a signal issue which stops the, the battlecruiser force swarming to engage the rest of the fleet. They instead concentrate on poor, and we have to say this, on the poor, poor, poor vessel 
which will always, always get sunk. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible story, the Beluka. Now, the thing is, if they hadn't stopped to concentrate on the Beluka, and if we consider the, the possible battle had carried on, if instead of stopping and concentrating and bombarding the Beluka to all ends and purposes and just doing that instead of followed the rest of the German fleet, the Germans could have lost more ships at Dogger Bank. Now, that's the first change you could have to any potential Jutland battle. Because what happens if it's not just Blucher that's lost? You know, at the battle, Blucher fires 12 8.2-inch shells. Gets 70 hits and receives 7 torpedoes. Sadlitz and De Flinger each get free hits. Now, the thing is, if they hadn't stopped, if they hadn't stopped when they did, if they'd carried on pushing and following them, instead of all swarming around Blucher and actually gone for uh, gone for the rest of the ships, there is a possibility. Ability, at least the Flinger or Sadlitz, probably Sadlitz, could end up sunk. Especially at several points. Technically, the squadron tends to be maneuvering in order of Sadlitz, Multica, the Flinger, and Bulka. But there is a possibility. You end up with at least another battle cruiser of the German fleet sunk. The thing is, though, doing that and engaging for longer like that, you are going to get more damage sustained to the British ships as well. Um, Lion received 16 hit, 16, 11, and 12 inch hits, and one 18.2 inch hit. And uh, Tiger received 6, 11, and 12 inch hits and one 8.2 inch hit. And Indomitable received a single 8.2 inch hit. I think. So, I do not see a scenario working out where I think the way the British escaped completely unscathed either. If they do sink a second German, ba uh, sink a second battle cruiser of the Germans, so Blucher and let's say, I'm gonna go with Sadlitz because she had more lost than tight at the Flinger. Um, I would say, under that scenario, and. Well, the Flinger gets hit by both uh, by Lion, Tiger, and Princess Royal, so she gets hit by all three. So it's it's a, it's a really sort of interesting scenario working out. But let's say one of their ships gets hit as well, gets sunk as well. The British are going to get some ships severely damaged, and that's going to come back, and that's going to feed into the Admiral class um, fast battleship design, as historically it did feed into extent into the battle cruiser design. I think that's also going to see a difference in scenario go forward because the British, the the battle cruiser fleet are positioned by British intelligence fairly well. They're given all the information. BT does his job pretty darn well. They position themselves. They're chasing them down, and then it's a breakdown of signals once you get into the fight, a breakdown of communications, a breakdown of comms, and I don't think Craddock, Sturdy. Or Hood. I don't think any of them would have had the same similar star structure as BT. So if BT has been replaced, and I see that as a, quite a possibility because of him talking with Churchill and trying to take over Fisher's role as Churchill's primary sounding board. Um, if Sadlitz is sunk, and remember she's the one which has her turret disabled in this fight, 
the Germans don't necessarily get the same they get the same information back about what happens. They don't necessarily know that it was ammunition storage and fix it and go into the following battles with it fixed. So we uh, so that might well affect the the Germans in their next performance as well. Um, the really interesting thing, therefore, is also hmm. If that if Sadlitz is the ship that goes, of course, Hipper also gets killed. So that changes who's in charge of the German battle cruisers or the first scouting group. Again, this changes a lot of history. Well, BC does do his job well there. But the thing is, any of the commanders that own information, I would expect to do the job well. Well, Maximus, I, I see them being laid down at the same time as they always were. And I see them being fast, battle, uh, fast battleships, not battlecruisers. I really don't see that. I don't see a because, despite not making public pronouncements about it, at every opportunity where he's been offered the chance to build battle cruisers, Badenberg has gone with of pushing for fast battleships. I do not see him going for battle cruisers. Given Sturdy is cited as one of the more cable officers, how did he come to make such an odd deployment in the first place? Surely he didn't need the level of supervision of that cable. Think about it from this perspective. Think about it, you're dealing with a global war going on, and you are try you are sitting there in your head worrying about what happens if, if, if. This is the trouble when you've got good officers doing it and why you need you tend to have senior officers above them looking in. Okay? Because I think with Sturdy, what happened to him was he literally went, well, what happens if they get past Craddock? Then I need a force here. And if they get past Cra here, then I need a force here. Which makes perfect sense until you ask the question of, why are you wondering if they get past Craddock? Just reinforce Craddock to make sure they don't get past him. But the thing is, you get into that mindset of worrying what happens if they do this and this and this, and you start breaking things up to give you backing lines of defense because that's the sensible thing to do under that circumstances because you've gone down the scenario of what happens if they get past. And no one's had the time to sit over his head and go, why are you banking on them getting past Craddock? How are they going to do it? There is a chance... PC was a good captain. Um, well, the thing is, uh, if they have had heavily damaged ships, and if they have got more damage, and if they've sunk more of the uh, more of the uh, German ones, then there is quite a strong possibility that they do bring, they do start order, they do get more into the production. Next one, paralysis by overanalysis. It's one of the big things that killed the 8th Army, pre Montgomery and Alexander. Yeah, it's. Nine times out of ten, paralysis by overanalysis, which I do love that phraseology. I was trying to remember that phraseology earlier, but yeah, that is more likely to happen to smart commanders, capable commanders, than it is to stupid ones. Because the smart one will think of all the options of where things can go wrong, a stupid one won't, won't notice them. A stupid one will make mistakes because they won't think of things. A smart commander will make mistakes because they'll overthink things. Try and get a commander in the middle and that you hope that goes right. But more often than not, you want one to go to the overthink side and have someone there who can go... Excuse me. They either need to be a chief of staff or they need to be their superior to go... Oh, 
Oh boy, I think you've gone down a rabbit hole. Um, it can affect all sorts of things down the line. In, f in fairness, you could just leave Blue Cut to New Zealand and Dumbledore. Uh, it's not a fair fight, no. Well, honestly, you could leave Blue Cut to the damaged HMS Tiger. That's honestly what you should have done. Everyone else should have bypassed Bluka, and Bluka should have been left to HMS Tiger, because Ti or well, no HMS Lion, because Lion was now BT's flagship. The flagship was damaged, and that causes some of the issues because the Lion has to fall out of line to let the others pass, and then they're sending signals, and the signals are mis are uh, miscommunicating. Well, supposed to be, but basically, they're spo they sh he should have been sig he was spo meant to be signaling them to carry on following the enemy fleet. Instead, he signaled them to surround Bluka. When realistically, they could have gone and followed the enemy fleet, and Lion could have gone and dealt with Bl Bluka. No, it's Any RN fast battleships will be designed with overseas present missions in mind as well, because these will be present ships. Oh, yes, they will be. So they will have Admiral's Quarters. They will have all those things. Oh, yeah. Naval treaties after this war would be very interesting. If the Royal Navy has... Especially because one of the reasons why the Admiral class are so delayed is because of the changes put into them, because of the re re uh, trying to turn battle cruisers into... Battle cruiser two words into battle cruiser one words into trying to even push for fast battleship realistically in the last three. They don't with Hood. Hood goes to battle cruiser, but the last three they're trying to push even further. And it just mucking them up so much you can't build them. Whereas if they're already fast battleships, they probably get built. If they're 18 inch fast battleships, this could mean that by the end of World War One, the Royal Navy has in service five ships of 40,000 ish tons or plus with 18 inch guns. At which point, your treaty limits are going to be interesting. <laughs> Leaving that to one side. Um, let's carry on. So, Jutland. Well, we already got rid of BT. Because he's off doing Gallipoli. But if Gallipoli's been successful, he might have come back. After all, Gallipoli's been successful. He might have been given the entire Mediterranean command and told to try and sort out the French and the Italians and coordinate them. Um, that might be what he's then rewarded with, going, yes, we want to give you the full Allied command of the Mediterranean. That would be an interesting post to give to BT. Uh, he's been successful with Gallipoli. That would be an Allied post. Give him another Allied post. He can sit there and try and command them. Um, that changes who's potentially there as the battle cruiser force commander. But as long as they're retailing their information, and then you also have the fact that Badenberg had been an intelligence officer. He trains his staff quite well. Do I think some staff officer? Some officer would have gone and made the smart Alec question, which they did, which then resulted in the signal out to Jellico, which said the high seas fleet weren't at sea, because that specific command, uh, a specific um, code, and you know, had was still sitting back in Wilhelmshaven. I don't know, but I think it's unlikely. I also think it's unlikely that if the battlecruiser fleet under a different commander runs into anyone, runs into the Germans, A, they'll be that separate from their Queen Elizabeth class battleships, and B, they'll be that far away from... Uh, they'll not communicate back. They'll be communicating back. So that's going to change it. I also think Jellico probably has, by this point, HMS Argincourt potentially as his flagship. Let's put that into one particular area. Jellicoe with Argincourt as his flagship. 
Let's all consider that. Jellico, the World War I equivalent of Ching Li, in his obsession with gunnery accuracy, armed with a 28-knot, 6-18-inch gun battleship at Jutland. The thing is, this is not going to be a good scenario for pretty much anyone. I don't think, though, that if the Germans have lost, the, let's say, Seidlitz at Dogger Bank, which is not unlike, un, 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 not a lack of possibility, whoever they replaced Hipper with, and there is a range of options in this scenario, they will have a different scenario going to uh, going on. If they're heading out, and if they're running into the Grand Fleet at full speed, do they decide when they run into the Battlecruiser Fort Fleet to turn around, or do they decide to chase them? Now, Sheer might make the same decision, because he might not have someone as good as Hipper. That is the possibility. He might not get someone as good as Hipper to replace Hipper with it he's lost. And so Sheer might get a good information, he might not. He might chase him. He might end up fighting the Grand Fleet in the middle of the day, rather than later in the day. It might be a couple of hours earlier. That's going to be a very different battle. If Fish, if Jellicoe is getting regular information about where the High Seas Fleet is from whoever's in Beatty's position, is getting regular or proper information from the Admiralty, then the British have sheer overwhelming numbers. There's also the interesting orders which are given the Harwich Force. They are sent out and then they are held back. They are sent out and then they are held back. I don't think, in the nicest way, Battenberg would hold them back. I think the trouble is you have a lot of very interesting officers in charge after Fish has left. There is a reason why Jellicoe ends up in as first Sea Lord so quickly, so soon. Um, it's because the officers after Fisher are really not up to the task in some regards, mostly in the fact that they're not really staff officers, they're not really administrators. My cooch. Um, Jellico would take uh, would take her is his flagship because a he'd wanted to uh, he'd built a designed her but also she that's the quickest way to get her trained up to the standard you need her to be and it gives him the fast capability he needs as a flagship he ideally needs to be able to get ahead of his fleet and see what's going on he ideally needs a ship which can do that and can give him that level of information and so i think Argincourt would be fisher would be Jellicoe's. And I don't think she's given to the battle cruiser fleet. Even under this scenario. There, there is the scenario where she could have been given to them if they do lose a ship. And it's, it could be a case of, well, we need to get the fast ships into the battle cruiser fleet. But in which case, I reckon she would go as the flagship of 5th Battle Squadron. But seeing as they like to keep 5th Battle Squadron homogenous, and I prefer their battle squadrons to be homogenous, and she is a battleship. I think she ends up with the Grand Fleet, and I think she ends up as Jellicoe's flagship. And no, I don't see the Royal Navy raiding the, the, the German coast. The Germans have too many minefields. The Germans do a massive amount of minefields. They have all sorts of submarines sitting out there. Yes, you've got a lot of subhunters. Yes, you can do it. But why risk it when you don't need to? The British are doing a blockade. You do raids if you want to, if you're forcing your enemy to come out 
and you know that sort of scenario if you want to do that the british are the reason the whole reason the british are working on the carrier raids is because they want to go over the minefields they don't want to have to try and go through them um because the queen lizard class didn't give him enough of a speed bump and because the queen lizard class were quite quickly taken away from him fifth battle squadron was not with him for that long and there is a reason why Michael Cooch, why BT ends up in HMS Queen Elizabeth and can justify it to Jellico as his new flagship uh, when she comes out. And there is the fact that also he could have been going to use, he might have, if, if he hadn't been removed when he uh, had been removed and he'd been around when Queen Elizabeth came out of her post Gallipoli refit, he might have taken her on as flagship as well. So that is an option. And no, if Hip is pulled from the sea by the British as a prisoner of war, then that doesn't really change things. It doesn't matter whether he's dead or a prisoner of war. He's still not able, available for Sheer to use. Well, the 18-inch shells will be fun. So, I'd say, under this circumstances, Jutland might end up being more close, might end up being closer to a victory. I don't know if you see a sort of entail in Trafalgar style victory over the High Seas Fleet. I wouldn't be surprised if you still see ships like Battlecruisers if they get caught in the crossfire getting sunk. But I could honestly see this being a scenario where the Germans find themselves, especially if there's a third engagement. Um, Scheer can maybe do his battle turn away twice. He did it historically twice. I don't think for a third scenario he needs that. I don't think a third scenario that works again. And I think... Potentially, especially with more information in earlier engagement, etc., would suit Jellico. Remember, with barely any information, he managed to successfully deploy twice and cross the T of the German fleet twice, and that's skillful. That's that's a lot of luck. Now, the other scenario is, of course, Jutland doesn't happen at all. The Germans see the high, uh, see the Grand Fleet coming and go, "We're running as fast as we can." But under that scenario. What could happen is the Germans might have to leave the pre-dreadnoughts behind. Because remember, they are limited by the top speed of the Deutschland class. Um, they are limited by their top speed of roughly 19 knots. And the 18 and a half knots to 19 knots if they're in full good condition. If there's any problems, they're slower. And the thing is, in this scenario, they might end up having to leave them behind. Even the Nassau class, they have a top speed of 20 knots. Um, so they're not much faster. Uh, the Heligan class, 20 knots. The Kaiser class, 21 knots. The German battleships aren't exactly the fastest battleships. So they might well end up having to sacrifice something to hold their rear to allow them to get away. As said, I think the Germans lose a fair number of ships. Um, as my interest in has pointed out, yeah. Basically... Queen of class, the Iron Duke is more inadequate and has his flagship facilities in it, versus the Queen of class. HMS Archincourt, A, he was involved in designing, so it's called, it sort of would have been like him being on a ship he designed him. It would be a ship he designed himself, and have pushed through to an extent himself. But more importantly than all of that, it's a big enough leap in capabilities versus the Iron Duke that it actually makes sense. 
The Iron Dukes are 21 sub -not plus not ships. The Queen Elizabeths are 23 plus not ships. There's not really enough of an advantage over the fleet for them to manoeuvre into them. I wouldn't say BT would, uh, Craddock could necessarily reverse the culture of gunnery in the battlecruiser fleet, but he might not need to as much, but also he could he could be moulded. So reversing it, no. Moulding it into a slightly different direction, yes. I think you could end up with a scenario where the British... Um, into the run to the north do lose some of their ships, yes. But potentially, uh, potentially any fleet, uh, if the battlecruiser fleet had operated with the Queeners of Class in close attendance, they might not lose, uh, might not get as much damage, because the Queeners of Class fifth battle squadron could really meet out the damage, and if they kept closer to them. Well, might well have been fine on some regards and that's sort of the run south then run north and if you're giving more information to to Jellico, Jellico is going to be steaming far faster and far harder for you for the for the enemy if he's got more information he's not going to slow down he's not going to go so all these things could to could change it to a very different battle and as I reckon, you probably have the Deutschland class getting sacrificed. Maybe the battle cruisers as well, because remember, Sheer does actually theoretically sacrifice, uh, is prepared to theoretically sacrifice the battle cruisers. Now, admittedly, he won't have Hippa to lead them in this time, but that might make him even more happy to do it. It could, it could even end up being the German battle cruisers and. Um, pre-dreadnoughts are sent to sacrifice themselves so that the rest of the high seas fleet can get away. No famous war spikes pirouette in front of the enemy. There still might be a war spike pirouette in front of the enemy, it's just it won't be in the same scenario it happens. So, the thing is I put this in is because at this point he's coming up for a placement. He'll been in post since 1912. 1916, that's four years in post, and he might not want to go, but he probably does want to go. There are enough issues. Uh, I'm probably building up. And Jellico, if he's won the Battle of Jutland, will probably replace him as first sea lord. And that allows him in many ways to bed in his strength and successes. I wouldn't be surprised about this at this point. There's going to be a lot of anti summary war, and if, yes, if Badenberg has got in the flag class, flag class sloops earlier, which I have a strong suspicion he might due to his own obsessions with mine warfare, so he might have ordered something akin to them earlier, which means they'll have an anti summary escort, and because, of, again, of his administration bent, I wouldn't be surprised if he'd done a full report and probably commissioned someone like Henderson to do such a report as Jellicoe does into the anti-submarine war, but I could still see that accelerating to the point at which they need to get new blood into the leadership post and someone go... Uh, basically four years of war uh, well no, three, two years of war running this is going to have worn him down a bit Plus, he had the year, a couple of years beforehand, so he would be 1912 to roughly 1916 at some point. I would reckon December 1916. That would be my suspicion. Um, enough time post Jutland for it not to be unseemly. Um, enough time... How do I put this politely? Uh, enough time uh, before the end of the war for it to be make sense, or rather, for it, you know, for him, uh, enough time for him to do something else. 
I just think it's at this point he would go. I the the point of me is I would love to say he'd stay around, but honestly, you need to start moving people up. It's an interesting one to consider when he'd go and whether he'd go, but I think he would. I really do think he would. Because I also think it's about time, and I think pr uh, potentially, potentially, he, it's, it's going to sound strange, but he's pushed through enough stuff that he'd want to. I... Um, Black Max was wait a second before we start to get the treaties, etc. And I don't really see any Admiral class being, or any fast battleships or cavalry ships being ordered earlier than they did. They could have been, perhaps if you've not got Courageous, Glorious, and Furious going through, they might be ordered earlier then. And, of course, you haven't got Renan or Repulse coming through, so you've got to have, so you, you might want to have some capital ship construction starting earlier, but it's going to depend on when Argincourt, Resistance, Renan, and Repulse, the battleships are all completed. <sighs> Come on, Cameron. Don't take this the wrong way. But, um, the Royal Navy had fast mine layers in World War One. I. I know I've done a video about them. Yeah, HMS Abdeel herself was converted into a fast mine layer. Um, she was a marksman class flotilla leader converted to the role. Um, the British had quite a few of them. So... It's... You know, you've got HMS, uh, you've got ooh, all those, you've got that. Yeah, there's a, there's a fair number of fast mine laying ships wandering around. Could he retire as naval advisor to King? Well, actually, there is a role which, in this period, does need to be led. Um, there's the Board of Invention and Research, which traditionally, Fisher goes to lead. And basically, this is otherwise known as planning for the next war. And you need someone senior to go and run it. Now, traditionally, Fisher gets kicked out of his post and gets given this and told to doddle off to it in about 1915 time. Traditionally. And... You can understand why, let's be honest. It makes sense to get, it plays to his strengths. Well, in the same scenario, it plays to the guy who used to uh, who used to be for a naval, uh, joint secretary for the naval and military def uh, military affairs uh, defense committee. No worries, Colin Cameron. I'm just sort of pointing out. I think I had done a video about them. Um, Traditionally, he goes off and runs this in 1915, but honestly, Battenberg going off and running it from 1916 onwards would not be a bad scenario either. Um, the Board of Invention Research starts out, believe it or not, as something which has actually been put in place by Battenberg. <laughs> this is what I this is what I find so funny about this one. Um, Fisher goes off to run this committee after he gets kicked after he gets kicked out. And realistically, the committee comes from 
well, the Board of Invention Research comes from some of the Admiralty's work and some of this work which have been done underneath the Board of the Admiralty as organised by Battenberg. Now, the board traditionally first met in July 1915 at Metropole Hotel, where it's, when it's been siphoned off from what it had been doing working under the Admiralty Board. And this is now the Metropole Hotel. If you don't know what this place is um, today, you'd have to look it up and call it the Corinthia Hotel. And it is a gorgeous hotel in central London, not far from Waterloo, and I honestly have to say I walk past, I've walked past it quite a few times over the years. It's an absolutely gorgeous hotel. I highly recommend going in it. You will not be disappointed. It's a fun, uh, fun thing. Um, oh, look out. Uh, okay. Just for you, I'm going to look up how much it would cost me to stay there. And I, you see, the thing is, I never know London hotel prices. Because I live close enough to London, I've never had to stay in there. Um, let's look this up. Oh, got it up. Got up the prices. So, if you want to stay there for the night of Saturday and Sunday in the cheapest room they have available over the weekend, one night over the weekend, it's 900 The cheapest rate they have is £900 for the night. So it's £900, okay, is the cheapest one. And that's for a superior king bedroom. Uh, it, you can... You, you can go for... Well, I would feel most appropriate in something called the Trafalgar Suite, which is uh, about £3,318. But you can go for the most expensive available is the River Suite, which is £5,215. So, uh, good luck, God bless, that's not in my price range. <sighs> yeah, basically, the, there was all sorts of interesting conditions after... World War One. <laughs> Come on, Karen, six and a half grand. Yeah, I, I might not be getting the same price as others because I have quite a genius high rating on Genius uh, for Booking dot com. Um, entirely thanks to an employer who insists on booking us through our own booking system. So, yay for them. <laughs> Double my monthly rent. <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm. I will say it's absolutely beautiful. I'm not sure whether it's. I would spend that much on a night. I do believe there's a premier in not too far away. Oh. So, the thing is, I think he would end up with something like the Board of Innovation Research. Um, I reckon it would be an interesting scenario for him to do so. I think he would be very happy wandering through it. And... 
Yeah. You obviously would spend that much if you were old money. Look, in the nicest way, I did, don't take this the wrong way. My family got where they did in the world. And I know I'm not by any means the richest member of my family by a long way. Um, thanks to a, a father who didn't necessarily listen to his own, uh, the own family advice on it. Um, You don't spend that much money. If you're old, old money, you have a club membership. You spend your money on your club. You might buy a lifetime membership, which would be expensive, but then the club dinner, the, the space would be very different. I, if I was staying in London, oh, certainly if I'd gone the traditional armed forces route and joined up the regulars. Uh, I would probably be staying in the Army and Navy Club. Because that's what my family who live far away from London stay in in London when they go in, when they move, when they come out to London. And that's still the standard. But for me, if I was... Because I've looked into this for the idea of, of course moving out of Cornwall, so I might actually need to do this occasionally if I'm visiting Atrus Belfast or something like that. I would probably use Hilton's, and I have a reason for that, because if you book them far enough in advance, the Hilton, and you book them with using points, you get the Hilton hotels for the same price as the travel lodges in Central London. And the amount of money the travel lodges are charging at some point in central London. Especially to be within respectable walking distance of Matron's Belfast. Like 25, 30 minutes. Um, you're paying the same price as you would a Hilton hotel. And I do not see the point in having a travel lodge if I can get a Hilton for the same price. There is a difference between those two objects and I do not see the point in spending the same money as I on this one as I would on this one and staying in this one. As much as I don't mind travel lodge, I quite like them because they're no frills and they've got everything you need. <laughs> when you're looking at the price and I was looking at the price for a light, it was basically, it's 200 I think this one, I feel the, the travel lodge was £202 for the night, and the Hilton was £225 for the night, including breakfast. And this one has a gym and those sort of facilities, and this one has nothing. And you sit there and go, I've got a, it'll be a two night trip. Is it really the difference in price? Yeah. But no, five grand a night, definitely not me. So, capsule hotels for the ship shape crown and the trip? Um, probably not. We probably will stay in one. We're, we're planning on... Uh, the, the idea would be to do at least one uh, one night in one, and one night in a traditional... in a in traditional Japanese hotel, spa sort of thing. But, um... We'd also like to do... We probably end up staying in the same as we're doing for Scandinavia. Scandinavia, we're st Scandinavia. The plan is the the Scandi hotels, which are Scandic hotels, which are perfectly nice, and they are sort of they're perfectly fine. But it's, again, it's the whole thing is, what size hotel do you want to stay in when you've got several grounds worth of equipment with you, i. e. cameras, laptops, drones, all those sorts of things. What sort of hotel do you want to stay in where you can guarantee a good night's sleep because you've got to work the next day and maximise all the hours. And that's that's the scenario. You have to think it through of what do you want. Also, don't take this the wrong way, but I, the capsule hotels, I have to say, I mildly do not like the idea of, because as all the ones I've read about, you have to get out of your capsule and go find a communal toilet. And I have, as a functioning insomniac, as I said before, one of my things I sometimes do in the evening is I go and have 
a bath or a shower. And I, do, I don't want to do that in a communal setting because that'll block it up for ages for other people. Ryokan. Thank you. Look, last time we looked at a place which said rent by the hour, we were all worried by the other things that would come with it. <laughs> uh, me and Drac have a bad habit of ending up in hotels in the wrong parts of town. Leaving that to one side. So, post impact on the post-World War II. Well, here you've got a modernized HMS Agincourt. Do we all agree she looks cute, modernized, given a war spite style refit? She had 5.5-inch guns originally built, is what I've given her, like Hood. And so they've kept the 5.5-inch guns. And so she has 5.5-inch guns all over her. Now, the reality is, if all these changes, what happens post-war? Well, let's say the Admirals have all been built. Five... 18-inch gun battleships in service in 1918-1919 period. Um, that's, that's, if there is a naval treaty scenario, there's a problem there. There's also a problem scenario if the Germans have lost Jutland, and if Gallipoli has gone the way we think it would do in this scenario, because the army and navy actually cooperating and working together, and carrying out a sensible plan. There is the very real scenario that Russia didn't drop out of the war when it did historically. That Germany hasn't been able to, uh, has been forced to fight a two front war for longer, which could have led to it collapsing earlier on both fronts, especially with the effect of the blockade, which could have shortened the war. There's going to be a whole debate. It might push the Germans to start the un. Uh, the unrestricted submarine warfare earlier, which may more, might force the Americans to join the war earlier. So the Americans could very well still get involved in the war. I do, do still see that as being quite a high possibility. But the reality is, even if the Americans do join the war and do want to get involved... Um, they have a problem with that. In that... If you want to try and draw up... A, a, imagine what Senator Tillman is pushing through as his ideas in a world where Argincourt and the Admirals exist as 18-inch gun ships. But, more importantly, think about what... The, you know, you're doing naval treaties. You can ignore Hood. You can try and ignore Hood. But what can you do about that? That's not going to make your life su successful in that scenario. You're going to spend your entire time trying to ignore Hood... And she's got the, the you, you you can do that with the Washington one as one, but there's five. So if there is a Washington Naval Treaty, the limit would become 18 inch guns and 45,000 tons, possibly even 50,000 tons. It's going to depend how big they are. It's going to depend how big they are. You know, the Admirals, you could be talking a 45,000 ton fast battleship. That's going to change things dramatically. And so... Any Washington Treaty done in that scenario, it's going to be a different world. That's, of course, if they've even continued on with the, uh, trying to put up. Because if they've ordered all their 16-inch gun ships and the British have got 18-inch gun ships in the service, then what do they do? Cancel the, 16, uh, cancel the South Dakotas? Cancel them and build 18-inch uh, build gun versions of them? Maybe they alter them to take eight 18 inch guns instead of 12 16 inch guns. They could maybe do that. 
And the same with the Lexingtons, perhaps. But that's going to require getting an 18-inch gun developed, which is going to slow them down in times of development. And is it going to work? Is it a sensible scenario for them? Primarily, you're going to change the world completely. If there is a treaty done in this scenario, the treaty is going to be far more interesting. I don't necessarily think you get a second class through before the treaty. Before any treaty. If there's a treaty done, that there could be, but it's there's also going to depend on you're going to be bashing up against the infrastructure level. So... The reality is, if you've built all four admirals, they're going to be big enough they're going to, that you're going to have to start doing an upgrade onto your infrastructure. So that's going to change what comes after the end freeze in, uh, in terms of end freeze, G freeze, and that sort of idea. Also, if you've gone down the fast battleship route, then the G freeze and the end freeze will be completely different. They might well be, again, continuations of the 18-inch gun fast battleship. And so you don't have a battle cruise, you don't have a far, you don't have a battleship, you have a fast battleship. They might be pushing for a 28 knot plus fast battleship at this point. They might be looking at what else can they do on the hull. They might be going for a 9 gun or even a 12 gun ship. So I don't think, there's a reason I don't think you get the 5 turret arrangement with the 5 twin turrets. And that reason is purely down to one of speed and concentrated engine power. And you always have to remember that if you want a fifth turret and you put it in the center especially, you are going to be affecting your hull, your your engine concentration, your power density, and your power generation, and also the heat effect on the magazines. So you would either move it forward or you would move it aft. The Americans tended to move it aft and have the turret farm after the gut engines. The British historically tend to push theirs forward um, I look at the G3s, look at the N3s, look at the, well, the Nelson, Nelsons. That tends to be what they want to do. And again, with with Rodney, Repul, uh, Rodney uh, with Renown, Repulse, with the King George Viths, they have the more turrets forward. So I would say if you have any scenario, you have it going forward. I do not see you getting a Fisher class, Blackbird Maximus. He is too divisive of personality. There is a reason, you know, it's not going to happen. It would still be Hood, it would be Anson, it would be Howe, it would be Rodney. It just, it's just not going to happen because, as fun as it might be for us to imagine, they are just too divisive of personalities. And whilst BT might get something. Even, it's uh, doubtful, because let's be honest, Hood dies, and even HMS Hood is not named for him, it's named for his forebear. So, yeah. No. So, I, I think... I think ultimately it's complicated, is the argument. It is definitely complicated. What happens after World War One is going to be incredibly different. Would Jellico still be a Sea Lord? That's the interesting thing. Would Jellico necessarily be lost as first Sea Lord if he's got uh, Battenberg wandering around the halls, or now Mount Batten wandering around the halls singing his praises, instead of Fisher again machinating? That's an interesting scenario. What happens with the fleet air arm? That's going to again depend. Because again, one of the scenarios we have to consider with Battenberg is he's pushed through the seaplane carriers. He's pushed through Hermes. There's all sorts of things which have been pushed through while he's been first sea lord and started. So if he'd carried on pushing them and been in charge till 1916, you might well have got a Hermes completed by 1916-17. If carriers are already in service, the Royal Navy might push through a scenario of, well, yeah, the the area we will tell what we will now retain is only the aircraft and air service which is purport which operates from the fleet. On that scenario, because 
they operate on a different political calculus to Beatty. Beatty believes he's always so big and powerful that they he will force them to do whatever he wants. Um, I think it. I think the reality, of course, is different. So I reckon, Badenberg, Jellico coalition at the top, they're going to be slightly less pushy on that one. They're going to have slightly less agreement agreeing on that one. So. I wouldn't be surprised if Jellico does stay in power longer. Remember, he is actually replaced by Roslyn Weymouth, and Roslyn Weymouth, who gives, who is te who is first Sea Lord when on April Fool's Day, nineteen eighteen, the decision goes through and it's actually transitioned. One of the things he had objected to was it, and then BT confirms it when he's first Sea Lord. Only changing his mind in 1925, realistically. Night 6831, you're talking about a class of cruiser which didn't exist. But yeah, maybe. Maybe in the 1940s, if they actually are building that class of heavy cruiser. Or, but in the nicest way, the scenario we're talking about has changed the world so much that, frankly, you have there is no idea what's going to be happening twenty years down the road. Because at this point, you're dealing with possibly a very different end to the war. Um, Germany could well have ended it early to try and get better terms for peace, as already been postulated in the chat. Germany could also have tried to do all sorts of random things. But one of the things I do think is I think Jellico, I think Banberg together would probably not want the fleet air arm portion, the portion of the, of the aircraft operating from ships, to be siphoned off to the Royal Air Force. They wouldn't accept that as a scenario. So I think they would go with the same case of, well, the Royal Marines are part of us, so will our fleet air arm be part of us. They might give away a chunk of the Royal Naval Air Service. They might give away the heavy bombers. They more than likely give away a chunk of the a chunk of the force which is in is in France, and they just go, yeah, we, we will we will give them all to your operational command, and then war uh, post war it gets divided up. The ones we need for the carriers go to the carriers, and anyone who wants to say Navy stays Navy. No, Tiger Lion and Blake are um, light cruisers, like Jake Patchington. Colin Cameron, given how odd some of the Royal Navy names are, you could have a cake class to go have an excuse to have an HMS Bannerberg. Oh, yes, you could. <laughs> oh, the Royal Navy has a lot of fun with names. The interesting thing is, how would he be remembered under this scenario? Would he be remembered as a great wartime leader? Would he be reviled for his decisions? Or would he be forgotten? Would he be a nameless face who was running the Admiralty? I have a feeling, sadly enough, knowing quite a lot of mm, what happened in the 1960s and 70s, especially with First World War history, and even with some of the modern history, I reckon he would still be being a reviled character. Because he doesn't have the dash and glamour of Fisher. He doesn't make the punchy statements. Look, being a quiet professional doesn't go well, down well in history. It often makes it very difficult for historians to pin good things on you, because you don't shout about doing them. And it makes it very easy for us to pin bad things on you, because often the people who do those things will blame you because they know you won't speak out about them. It's annoying. You have to look at all the things to try and properly evaluate someone in the past. And I do agree, though, that Blackmore was Maxwell's, that if Craddock had been at Coronel, I, and Craddock had come back and, you know, they win Coronel with a 9.2-inch gun, then an, a new generation of 9.2-inch gun cruisers might well have been built. 
And that could well have become the model for the Hawkins class. Oh, it could have been the equivalent Hawkins class, which could well then change the whole approach for the, any treaty cruiser limits. Because let's be honest, if it's a 9.2 inch gunship, it's going to be roughly 18,000 tons. I think yeah, I think it'd be like a bit like Jarvis and Vincent. Well remembered by historians but not by people in general. Could well be that one. There is a lot of arguments for maintaining the um ships the, the, the command of the crews on ships, and basically the the oldest one given by the navy is the command structure on a ship should be one. And everyone has to follow the naval rules aboard a ship. It would be interesting. It would be interesting. I think it would change things dramatically on several levels. Ah, Tanner. So, before we finish, and before we, you know, I disappear off to have my comfort break and then Discord, uh, any questions? Because I'm happy to sit on here asking questions about this topic. Specifically, if you're going to bring up other topics, then give me lots of warning so my brain can go and find information. I'm sorry if I'm being a bit strict this evening on topic. It's, I've spent the day dealing with lawyers. I spent last night, as I messaged in the chat last night, I spent last night with a large number of my family. Taking over every table in the restaurant, barring one. Where there was a young couple on their first date. Oh, oh that poor couple. <laughs> I booked for 36. We ended up having roughly 47. At various points. The others had booked other tables without me realising so that they, you know, they would be in there. Um, oh, <laughs> it's a maximum capacity of roughly 50 in the entire, in the restaurant. It's a lovely little rest Chinese restaurant and, um, yeah. There was this poor couple on their first date in one, co in one corner surrounded by a birthday party. <laughs> And what I love is, for about the first 20 minutes, I think they were there, various aunts kept going up to them, because one of them looks sort of like part of our family, because quite a lot of us have my hair colour and green eyes. It's quite common throughout my family. Um, it's quite a, it's quite a common mixture. Um, the other ones that address the family are sort of dark-haired, blue-eyed, roughly. Uh, or brown-eyed. And... Um, one looked like this, and the other one looked was brownhead. And so they kept, they kept, the answerers kept walking up, going, "So, who, which cousins are you? So, which?" <laughs> I think they got the same. Ah, uh, and I think both got told at various points individually that you know, if the first date didn't work out, they had nieces, etc., to introduce them to. It was just, yeah, it was fun. It was. It was just <laughs> they did have a unique but they were very good sports they had cake they did enjoy they did join in on the happy birthday yeah they will either all be invited to their wedding or <laughs> we're gonna be case study number one in their eventual breakup if they if they don't have if they actually have a, get another date. Um, but historically, Jack Abbey can go to Australia. Could Badenberg have pursued something similar? Yeah, Badenberg might have been given something similar. Um, historically, that was... Uh, historically, what happened to him post-war 
is he spent most of his period trying to gather together his family. It took him f nearly three years to get his sister-in-law, the Grand Duchess Elizabeth Rona's body, sent to Jerusalem to be buried, and he was there to bur get her buried. Um, as said, he'd had to give up Kent House for financial reasons, so he probably w he might still have to do that because his financial investments in Russia have been seized by the Bolsheviks and. You know, the German property he had become valueless with the collapse of the mark, and he sold Hellingberg Castle, which he'd inherited from his father in 1920. Um. Yeah. It's a, it's a not a good time for him post-war. He was made Admiral of the Fleet retired list in August 1922, I think. And yeah, he, he actually had a voyage with on HMS Repulse because Captain Dudley Pound invited him because his son was serving on there. So he was invited there. He dies, actually no, it's 1921, August 1921 he's made it. And he dies in um, the annex of the Naval Military Company, Army and Navy Club, in, uh, in um, September 1921, heart failure following influenza. Who would succeed Jellicoe? Whoever had been in command of the battlecruiser fleet, probably. So, especially if it was sturdy, it's likely to be sturdy. Um, Craddock, potentially, if he'd been in charge of it, or Hood, potentially, if they'd been in charge of it. If they've done well enough, they could end up succeeding Jellicoe. But there are other officers. I've done it before, but sturdy is most likely. I say, what might a 1939 King George V class look like in an N3 G3 built world? Other than having 18 inch guns or 16.5 the inch doesn't work, obviously, in large 25 thousands. Um, well, in an N3 G3 built world, you have a very different scenario because if they've been actually built, then you have a naval treaty limit of, what, 60,000 tons? Uh, if they actually have treaties, if they don't have treaties then you could well be dealing with the British having built another four or five classes of ships before they get to them. So there is no real way to work that one out. The odds are the British have gone to something which is a four triple gun arrangement by that point with two forward, two aft, because they've done their infrastructure work and they're quite happy with the triple turret. Going for the quadruple turret adds a lot of complication unless you're going for four quadruple turrets. And I don't think four quadruple 16.5 inch guns are necessarily on anyone's but order list. I definitely don't think four foot quadruple 18 inch guns are. Unless you've increased in the infrastructure massively. There will be a class of battleships in that time period because they will still keep building battleships as long as everyone else is building battleships because that's what you do. But it will be building up on each class. Yeah, they could have got adopted if they played their cards right. Yeah, because it's always a possibility. That's what, at least they had something to talk about on the way back to the tube. Um... No, they were in the group I walked back to the car park. So they, were going, they weren't going back to the car. They went back to the car park. 
because I walked a load of the um, younger female members of the family because we were in two car parks and it seemed like all the groups parked in one and we'd actually, and we'd actually parked in that one but all the girls who come individually parked in the other car park and I basically walked them all back and that couple as well back to that car park made sure they all got in their cars and were all fine and then I walked back to where my car was parked luckily I'd come solo so I could get, get everything organised it was fun and before anyone thinks A. I would have done that if I hadn't been told to and B. In the um, if you'd seen the look on my mother's and aunt's faces uh, aunt's and very, uh, various aunt's faces you would, have not, uh, you would have done exactly the same thing Cherry pie was lovely. Coming on, so th if this opens a can of worms and Bandberg was in place for a signal position, you suggest would he have been the one creating battle plans and new weapons to fight the Osana? Is that the case, right? I... They would have had it, but in the nicest way, the British have battle plans for fighting the Americans, always. Again, the British... As I've said before many, many times, and I'll say again... You have plans on the shelf for all the worst case scenarios. It doesn't matter how unlikely they are. If they're a bad, if they're a worst case scenario, you have the plan ready to go. I'm sure the Americans to this day maintain a plan for the invasion of Canada. No matter how unlikely it might be, they need to do it. I'm sure they do. Because if a situation happens where they need to, then they will really need to. And Canada is one of their nations on their border, and is a could be a could be a major. Again, I could see the British still having a plan for probably for Ireland if they needed it. They wouldn't talk about it. They wouldn't want to. It's very unlikely to ever be done. And I've never asked about its existence. But I'm sure with the threat of communism in the 1980s and all the other things. What ha and well uh, during the Cold War, what happens if there's a communist revolution in Ireland that is uh, usurping the government? What do the British do? Well, that's a major threat to NATO. That's a major threat, a threat to all sorts of scenarios. They probably have an intervention plan, aka an invasion plan, ready to go, and that's you know because that's a worst case scenario and i'm sure the irish have a worst case and have a similar plan for war of what happens if britain gets taken over by i don't know what and let's say who would be the most Let's say Mr. Blobby comes to power in the UK on a platform of invading and uniting all the islands of the British Isles and the islands around it. Taking over the full Faroe Islands, all those things, and Ireland. And wanting to unite them under one government. I'm sure the Irish have a plan for that scenario of how they would try and defend themselves. I really do. And probably that is hold the line long enough until the Americans turn up. But... They will have that plan. It's very unlikely to virtually impossible for that to happen. But they will still have that plan because you have that plan. Who would succeed Jellicoe? As said, probably whoever succeeded him with Grand Fleet and you know, that sort of scenario would follow up. Um, yeah, the mess. King Edward VIII would happen, no matter what happened. I'm talking like, but if Russia had gotten their supplies via the Black Sea, there wouldn't be revolution in Russia. Well, there still could have been a, there, there, there still could have been the original revolution in Russia, but it probably wouldn't, it might not have been a, there might not have been a Bolshevik revolution, as I've discussed before. I think I, I, there is a whole possibility that, yeah, he doesn't lose a lot of family members. And there would potentially be less influenza as well, yes, going around the post-war.
Sturdy, was aggressive, but capable, and fairly good at his job. Coming on, Raichi does the point. Given the iron habit of using up officers' health, do we seem lasting night of dinner given actual wartime responsibility and workload? That's why I have him retiring in 1916. That's the only way he survives. Honestly, otherwise the guy probably dies about 1917. By the speed and arm would probably go up once they hit the four triple 18-inch gunfire body shots. Yep. I really want to suggest, do a patron suggestion where America has an alliance with German Empire and joins all one on their side to see how it changes, it changes everything. The BEF might not be deployed to Europe. Or rather, a section of the BEF, the Expeditionary Force, might have to, it might be deployed to Canada as part of the war plans. If America's in on the alliance, then frankly, there's going to be a war plan to reinforce, uh, reinforce Canada. They're going to want to reinforce uh, France, but they're also going to want to reinforce Canada. Tanev uh, I'm not, no. I'm not getting into that. We're not playing politics. Channel, I use that's why I use Mr. Blobby. Oh, and we do, I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain Britain hasn't planned it. I'm absolutely certain both Britain and France have a plan for A, blowing up the Channel Tunnel, and B, for invading each other. In the nicest way, we've been at war enough over the last two thousand, uh, over the last thousand, uh, fifteen hundred or so years. Um, and frankly, if we don't, we're not judging by history. We fought literally 200 years wars of us each other. Yeah, they're over thinking. Ditto on my family. Um. <sighs> Although my family has a habit of coming back from France with a rather a large amount of loot. Almost as if we can we care more about procuring. Other good, other's goods than we do about fighting the battles. Bonus: Would there be any six and a half inch battleships if you go directly to eighteen? That's an interesting question. It's going to depend on the rate of fire. If they decide the eighteen inch isn't a sufficient enough rate of fire, they might experiment with sixteen and a half inch ship. They might do. Yeah, but let's be honest, there was a bit of a German... Uh, um, America did start off World War One being sort of German-friendly. You have to remember, where did the big merchant... Well, how do I put this? The big um, trade submarines go to? They go to America. Uh, you know, the submarines which are being sent to carry... To transport goods backwards and forwards between... I think you go to America to pick up urgent vital supplies for the German war effort. Where are they going to? They're docking in America. Well, 
We like selling champagne, Melanie, 1640. It's going to defend on hull for 96831 and where you've got your armor balanced. Exactly what power it's going to need. <laughs> oh. Hi, Steve Clark. No, it would be tempted to downsize them to 16 and a half inch, probably, Colin Cameron. William Jennings Bryan was a dis would, dis was, uh, would disagree. He would resign over Wilson mentioning being too British. Pro-British. Yes, but the trouble is, his definition of being pro-British um, was basically anything which was pragmatic in terms of there is a reality for America in World War One, and it's the same reality as a lot of minor powers find themselves in World War One. Who do you have to deal with? Germany is being blockaded and can't do anything. Britain is going around the world doing lots of things. So you have to take a pragmatic approach. If you try and ignore the blockade the British are doing, you're going to get into trouble and might find yourself in a War of 1812 scenario. And the Americans really didn't want to get into a War of 1812 scenario. They didn't want to get into that scenario. They'd managed, they felt they'd evolved past that. And also, to be honest, they weren't keen on both, but they'd had more run-ins with the Germans than they had the Brit uh, Brits. You have to remember, there's a famous storm which wipes out an American and German fleet, and the British ship which had been sent to watch them survives. There is a long history of German-American antagonism with the Germans pushing into, trying to push into South America and causing issues. So, as much as the Americans try to be, would like to be neutral, and as much as the Americans have a strong element of pro-German campaigning going on in their politics at the time, and pro-German influence, you should never doubt the British out. And I, I, what I find funny is you hear a lot about the Irish lobby, you hear a lot about the German lobby, you hear about all these lobbies in America, and the most well-funded lobby during this period, the largest lobby in this period, and the pro arguably most successful lobby, is the Pilgrim Society, which is still running to this day in America, and it's the pro-British lobby! And it's overlooked. I mean, I'm not sure how they do the job they do, because I have literally, I have managed to find two decent history books about them. And if you look in quite a large chunk of American popular cultural histories, they are completely ignored. And you go, well, that means one of two things. One, they have no impact. Or two, they're very good at covering their impact. And the Pilgrim Society has a lot of conversations and things with, like, the, um, what are they called? The Daughters of the American Revolution, the Daughters of... Oh, and the Mayflower Society and all those things, organizations. They have all sorts of connections running through American politics to this day. And they tend to do it through, how do I put it, social engagements. They're, they're very, I, th I think they're far more efficient than people, and far more effective than people understand, uh, people that let, uh, allow them to be. Oh, my family usually came back with both of those. Wives and, uh, wives and lots of money, yeah. They came back from India with the same. They came back from China, the same. They came back from all those. It's just... Yeah, my, my family just goes around the world and finds people to ha uh, people to bring back and marry. And quite a few from Scandinavia, and some from Russia. Yeah. 
yeah, it's just it's almost as if the British, the uh, the Pilgrim Society don't need to organise parades and big get-togethers like that to show their strength because there are quite so many connected with Britain at the time. Yeah, Canada was. There is also the other fact that Canada in this period does make Texas does make modern Texas look a little bit soft. Um, also, there's the very real fact that let's be honest, in any eighteen twelve scenario in World War One, Mexico would certainly have sided with Britain, with Britain and France because whilst Germany couldn't back them up, Britain and France could. And then the Americans have to deal with a two-front war. And yes, they would probably wear they could pro they could probably win both, but that's going to require infrastructure and industry, and it's also going to be a scenario of if they're the ones who've declared war. In this scenario, where in support of the Kaiser, there's going to be a lot of politics against them. And that politics could be even more divided than it was in the War of 1812. Remember, the War of 1812 was not universally popular as some people who do the histories of it would like you to believe. Uh, it was not as universal. A 1812 scenario in 1914 would not be so. It would be even less popular. Anyway, so what we got coming up? Yeah, and of course, the other advantage the British would have, would have uh, allies would have with Japan in the Pacific. So, basically, America would find itself in a lot. Of, that could be a lot of problems. Um, probably the Japanese would first invade Hawaii and then work their way across. So, yeah. Um, it's a case of, mm, you might, you, you are A, not prepared, as prepared for war as you would like to be, and especially not as you are in 1917, and B, hmm. Yes, the trouble is, one of the chief people arguing against any such scenario would be that same publicist of the War of 1812. Um, it would be it would be Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt, it would be definitely not key. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt would absolutely not like the idea of doing that scenario at that point. No, I'm not Yes. Um. Whilst you are right of, well, to be honest, the occupation goes from... April 1914 to November 1914. So saying they they block it, they they occupied it until November 1914 is kind of like, so it gives you an idea it's longer than actually is. It's, uh, but the real problem for the U.S.-American uh, sort of relations at this point is, um, oh, there are so many issues in this scenario. But the thing is, America's actually supported in the scenario by the U.K. Mexico is supported by Germany and Italy. If you spin that around and the U.K. supports Mexico, in April 1914, they're not at war. If America's made an alliance with, with with Germany, Britain might well have made a friendship deal with Mexico, in which case the Americans turning up to blockade Mexico and invade Veracruz might end up finding themselves having a British uh, fl fleet turning up to go, excuse me, what are you doing? And in 1914, the American fleet is in no way ready for the scenario that's going to come. Um... And they do have Florida and they do have Utah, but 
let's be honest, in 1914, the British have a lot more ships. It's it's a, a whole different... It's a whole... It, it changes history so much, you have to go back and almost go, right, and when does this happen? What's going to be the result of this? How is this going to change the Anglo-American Anglo naval race? Is the Anglo-American naval race still part of... Um, how do I put this? Has the is the Anglo-American naval race still one of a qualitative race rather than a quantitative race? You'd have to work through quite a lot of complicated scenario to try and push it all through. It's an interesting time. Anyway, glad to hear that. See of it. No, I don't think Lexington Battle Cruisers tax technology at the tax and technology of the time. So, um, next week is another Patreon suggestion. Next week is also the French Naval Air Aircraft Squadron System, the new book for which has not arrived. I do find that annoying. Let me check on that. Because I got a weird text the other day, which I presumed was not the case. No, it's supposed to arrive tomorrow. Yeah, they have my address, they have all those sort of things. That's fine. That's good. Oh. Also, small note to everyone. Sister's birthday parties are expensive, and sister's birthdays are expensive, especially when they're 21 every time. Do not ask me why. Do not let your family get into this habit. <sighs> Trying to find a 21 again t-shirt for a reasonable price? Goodness gracious me. It's zero years old in my training next week. Yes, it is. Woohoo, that's going to be fun. And, uh, yeah, it's French Naval Aircraft Squadron System. And I'm going to be on Discord in a bit. After I've had a bit of a um, comfort break. No, someone was trying to reach me claiming to be from the Royal Mail. And they needed me to um, go... They sent me a text asking me for my address. And, uh, yeah, that was that was fishing. Pretty much what I had to do. 21 again had to be a custom print, especially in the size and colour wanted. Can't you reuse it? Oh, good lord, no. Oh, don't get me started. No, uh, they, needed my, they, they needed my address. Royal Mail needed my address. Yeah, I didn't believe that. Anyway. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Matrix for done. Thank you, Mali Sixty Forty. Thank you, Team Locker. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, CM and David. Thank you, Nine Six Eight One. Thank you, Dan Freeman. Thank you, Colin Cameron. Thank you, Paul Amos. Thank you, Blackmo Maximus. Thank you, Rob Rebecca. Thank you, Rat Rat. Thank you, Black Powder. Thank you, John Shea. Thank you, Railway Finker. Thank you, Colin Cameron. Thank you, Steve Clark. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, Dirt Squad. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do, 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 do. Let's go carry on up. Alan Gar, thank you. Black Mountain Maxwell. I might have said already, but I'll say it again. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for enjoying. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. 20 chocks a day. Make sure to have 21 today. Give yourself a treat. Uh, Duke of Petunan, thank you. Thank you much, everyone. Thank you, Cody85. Thank you. Ooh, 
Darius Rodowski, thank you very much. Calvin Gasper, thank you. Um, I think I said that. Oh, damn, damn, damn. He went, Cody 5 said thank you very much too. Seneca Nero, of course, thank you very much. Stafford Thompson, Thomas and Jack Ryan, uh, Jack Ryan, thank you. Um, Andrew Mosher, thank you. Blue, Blue would have been an interesting left in the Baltic to counter the Rurik. And if Wilhelm had been born without a wither arm, who knows? He might have been more polite and better, but we'll never know, sadly enough. Thank you, Malaga. And thank you, Emma Stoms. Thank you, everyone who's been watching. Hope you've enjoyed. As said, we'll be on Discord in a bit. Just going to have a quick comfort break. Thank you, everyone. Take care. And next week is Zeros of Mediterranean. Tomorrow is... The USS Akron, which I'm probably going to re-record a bit of a chunk of tonight. And, yeah. Thank you, VM Williams. Thank you, Archer, and hope you enjoy. Toodles.